So let me welcome you to this very different ICS workshop that we have this year. It's um, going to be recorded, so please be aware of that as you interject or contribute. Uh, you'll be recorded for posterity, and people will be able to download this live during the ICS itself in a couple of weeks' time, and afterwards too. So uh, enjoy your minute of fame, and please do use the chat and involvement as we go. I'll be giving you a couple of other instructions as we start uh, in a second, but let me go through a couple of introductory things. First of all, uh, my name is Andrew Gammy. I'm chairing the workshop, and we have three others connected with the Bristol Urological Institute here. You'll be able to see Laura. Give us a wave, Laura, who's the manager of our urodynamic unit. Arturo there, Buenos Dias, joining us from Mexico, who's a consultant urologist, and Marcus Drake, another consultant urologist uh, based in Bristol. So we'd like to acknowledge the grant that has helped the ICS put this on. And I'll welcome you to this interactive workshop. Now, when we say interactive, of course, it's not going to be quite hands-on as we usually do, but we will be firing questions to make it as interactive as we can uh, as we go. We say basic urodynamics because this is aimed at someone who is perhaps starting their experience of urodynamics someone who is about to start, this will give you a great introduction to what the topic is about and how to run a clinic. It won't give you the full certificate to start a department. It won't give you all the experience you need, but it will be a start. So we'll just uh, disclose our, my affiliations here and introduce you to the program. So after a second, I'll hand over to Marcus Drake, who will introduce urodynamics as a whole, and then I'll take you through some physics, which you may be pleased to see is only 10 minutes. In our full course, you get two hours, so you've done pretty well by coming to this one. I'll then run through setting up equipment just to show you what a clinic looks like and what you have to do. And then Arturo will take you through running the actual test. We've got a little break at about uh, halfway through. So that's going to be uh, one and a half hours from now. And then Laura and Marcus will take us through what happens when you're in the test and got some problems and after the test when you have to interpret. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. I'll be running some videos in my tests, my, my setting up equipment section. And we're grateful to Prometheus for providing those to us for the demonstrations. Please feel free to use the chat window as we go and uh, use the raising hand if you can find it for questions. We will be allowing specific space for questions as we go through our talks. So if you've got a question and it's not answered immediately, please do wait and someone will get back to you on that in due course. We may also fire questions at you. We do know your names. And so uh, we will take that information, if you don't mind, to fire questions at a couple of people at a time, just so that we can not make sure you're awake, but involve people in the talks and get some feedback as to any specific answers that we're looking for. So I hope that's going to be acceptable. Please do remember to mute and unmute as you uh, as you go. Uh, I'm sorry that this is out of focus. Someone's mentioned um, it is just introductory slides, so don't worry too much. Uh, I'm actually just saying what's on the screen. And if you want further discussion, uh, I'll encourage you to come to bui.ac.uk and send us any questions you've got for later. Uh, we're very happy to answer questions. So I'll hand over to Marcus now. Thank you very much, Marcus. Well, good evening, and thank you very much, everybody, for giving up your evening. This is a, a very important aspect of our clinical practice in the International Continent Society. So I'm just going to do about 10 minutes on the very basic aspects of urodynamics. This is a test that actually forms part of an overall assessment pathway. Of course, somebody presents to their doctor and the history and examination is always the starting point of any clinical evaluation, including for lower urinary tract symptoms. 
We love to use symptom scores because it breaks down the type of presentation into storage, voiding, post voiding, or a mixture so that you can really make sure that you understand where the patient is experiencing the problem. And good symptom scores will also steer you towards which of the symptoms are the more bothersome for the patient. We need to do a urinalysis because it's very important to exclude inflammatory change as perhaps driving some of these symptoms. And of course, urinary tract infection is key in causes of inflammation. We might do an ultrasound in some contexts. For example, somebody with neurological disease, we'd like to understand if their bladder is constantly holding on to some urine or whether their kidneys might be swollen. So that is the forefront of our clinical evaluation. And what we will always do is consider whether we can now give conservative therapy before undertaking anything invasive like the main urodynamic tests that we'll be discussing. So conservative therapy with pelvic floor exercise training, with bladder training, with fluid advice, with medications, these generally precede a urodynamic test. We may well include a free flow rate test early on in the assessment. It is certainly part of the full test of systometry. So systometry is really referring to the measurement of pressures in the patient. It's done whilst fluid is put into the bladder, so we're not waiting too long to see something happen. We'll measure pressures as well when the patient passes urine, and that would be a pressure flow study. We might adapt the test a bit by including extra features. So at the bottom, we've listed things like video urodynamics, where the filling medium is an X-ray contrast, so you can take X-ray images and visualize the urinary tract. A urethral pressure profile, which tells you whether the sphincter is either very weak or excessively strong, or indeed normal. Whilst ambulatory urodynamics is done with a much smaller piece of equipment, enabling the person to go about their usual daily activities. They'll not be covered today, but they do represent an opportunity to get more detailed information. The reason we'll do our urodynamics is so we can decide on therapy. And it is specifically the invasive therapies like an operation that really means that you want to make sure your decision is as well informed as possible because a person having an operation is generally going to be extremely keen to have a suitable operation. And urodynamics helps us achieve that. Now, the fundamentals of a urodynamic test is about reproducing symptoms. We use pressure measurements and test flow in the hope that we can actually explain the underlying mechanism. But crucially, we need to make sure that we've got that history carefully done with the symptom score, and we need to maintain a dialogue during the test so that we can make sure that the symptoms are reproduced and that we can understand what's going on and when it is relevant. So the fundamental measurements taken for pressure are those from the bladder, which we refer to as vesicle pressure, and we use the abbreviation PVES throughout the rest of this uh, evening. There's also abdominal pressure, PABD, which we have to get because of course, the bladder is an abdominal organ. So abdominal pressure change is going directly to influence the bladder. We tend to get P abd by measuring from the rectum, but it can be from the vagina. We use a computer which will calculate the difference between vesicle and abdominal pressure. If you subtract abdominal from vesicle, that tells you what contribution the bladder itself has made by squeezing on the urine. And we refer to that as detrusor pressure. It has an active component generated by bladder muscle squeeze, but also a bit of a passive one. It can be a bit stiff, resist filling. So an elastic, 
passive resistance, which can cause a steady climb in detrusor pressure during filling. So we're computing detrusor pressure throughout the filling and during pressure flow studies, plotting it against physical and abdominal pressure along with the flow rate. The flow is an important observation, of course, and if it happens during the filling phase, that means this patient is incontinent. Of course, flow is expected during the pressure flow study, but that always follows a very explicit instruction. Once the person has reached a full bladder, we give what is called permission to void. That is the threshold beyond which you're going to be looking at the pressure flow study. If permission to void has not yet been given, flow indicates incontinence. So I'd like to just talk us through a typical trace, just to discuss really what's the sort of observations that we measure, how we capture, how we work with this. So on the right hand side, you can see that there are indicated things like VH2O, this is volume of water, what has been put into the bladder. 600 mils is the upper limit here. Well, this is only going up to about 230 mils. Abdominal pressure measured from the rectum. Vesical pressure measured from the bladder. Detrusor pressure computed by the difference between these two. And these scales are all running up to 100 centimeters of water. Flow at the bottom in mils per second. And it's worth noting volume and abdominal pressure appear at the top of the page. That's because sometimes the pressures generated in the blue or the green lines get very high and might go off the top of the page and be missing if they were to be put near the top. So we expect to see volume and less important information plotted at the top. Note as well this time scale. So it's going up to about nine minutes. The test typically can be done in something like nine minutes to quarter of an hour. At the start of the test, you can see that the blue and the red line are on zero. This is referred to as zeroing to the atmospheric pressure, and that will be discussed as a crucial point, an expectation of standardized professionally run tests. Zero to atmosphere. Don't zero whilst recording from the patient. So assuming that zeroing to atmosphere was appropriately done, as soon as you start recording from the patient, you'll see that the pressure has gone up well above zero. And that is, of course, because the patient has some weight. There are organs in the chest and abdomen which are pressing on the pelvic organs, bladder and rectum, so you expect some increased pressure to be present. Because the resting pressures in the abdomen are also seen in the bladder, because the bladder is an abdominal organ, when the computer subtracts abdominal from the cycle, you'll see that that detrusor line does sit generally very close to zero. So that is appropriate. We like to see checks being done during a test with a cough to ensure that both the abdominal and bladder pick up the cough nice and quickly and symmetrically. And so you just see a tiny little change on the green line. That means that the test seems to be running smoothly. You can also see that there are provocation tests. A provocation test indicates when you're trying to elicit the symptom. And the common one includes stress testing, physical stress by a sequence of coughs, or doing a hefty strain, because this will be a way of trying to elicit stress incontinence. So stress testing has been done on two occasions, in this case, once when the bladder was at about 200 mils, and once where the patient had reported their bladder felt full enough, thank you, I'd like a pee soon. We refer to that as systometric capacity, CC. 
Having done our stress tests, well, on this occasion, we did not see leakage. But the patient wanted to pass urine, so we'll check that the subtraction is working fine and then give permission to void P2V, at which point the patient passed urine effectively, raised some pressure in the bladder, presumably completely passed urine, but you'd need to have a scan to double check whether that was the case. Would you like to do, see a cough after voiding in order to decide that the pressures during voiding were measured appropriately. So in a nutshell, you can see many of the fundamental aspects of a urodynamic test nicely illustrated on this trace. So when we work in urodynamics, we want to make sure that our tests are acceptable to, you know, you don't want to have somebody suffering a miserable experience during urodynamics, so be considerate aiming thereby to get meaningful information based on the patient's presenting symptoms. So you need to know the symptoms, and then you need to understand how to elicit them during a test. You've got to set up the equipment correctly, otherwise you might be deluding yourself in the reliability of your measurements. You've got to run the test right. And at the end, it's a detailed report covering the history, the examination, the urodynamic findings, and potentially suggestions for treatment. Very important. Obviously, some patients are stressed when they come to the urodynamics unit, knowing that they're going to have tubes in their pelvic organs. So they'll be anxious, and therefore that might influence the waterworks behavior. So you've got to be explicit in your report were the symptoms appropriately reproduced during the test or was it unrepresentative? So that completes a brief introduction, a 10 minute flight through urodynamics and we'll repeat much of that over the next couple of hours. But I did want to bring to your attention a uh, free resource from the Neuro Urology and Urodynamics Journal, which the International Continent Society provided a supplement to the journal where many of the fundamental key basic aspects of running urodynamics and various um, assessments in the lower urinary tract symptoms field are described in a lot of very... And that's the conclusion of my talk. Thank you all for listening. Marcus, thank you very much. Um, I think possibly it's going to be best to leave questions for the details as we get on later. So if you're happy with that, Marcus, we'll move on and then allow people to come back to your session uh, on interpretation with their specific questions on details. Uh, because I'm keen that we get into the physics, not just because that's my field, but because we need that as our background to all the measurements we're doing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a, a very brief introduction to it, but hopefully we'll set the scene. So we'll start the uh, basic principles. That's right. And it's in a nutshell because we have the, uh, the quick version through here. So I'm going to uh, take the control here and acknowledge as I start that Gordon Hosker uh, is my predecessor in setting up this course. So what is pressure? I wonder what you would say if you put your mind back to your studies at school, what pressure is. Many would talk about push, but in fact, it's more than push. It's actually the force per unit area. It's how spread out that force is over an area. So if I stand on both feet, my weight is distributed over the soles of both feet and I feel a pressure underneath there. But if I raise up one leg and stand on one foot only, I notice an increase in pressure. Why is that? because the same force, sadly the weight has not changed, is going through a smaller area. So the force per unit area is greater, the pressure is more, and that's what I feel. So when I think in terms of pressure in a fluid, what happens? Well, have a look at this. We've got a number of syringes all set up together to a common base at the bottom here. And you can see that they're all at the same height. And if Rob can get it to run, that's great. If not, we can just note the fact that this column here is all at the same height. You see, 
if you're swimming in a pool, for instance, and you go down under the water, you feel a pressure on your ears, don't you? Now, if you were to swim that distance under the water in the sea, which is much wider, well, you would feel the same pressure. You know that because we go underwater, we feel pressure. And even if you were to do it in your bath in a tiny area and go the same distance underwater, you'd still feel pressure on your ears. The point is that it doesn't matter how wide the tube is, it doesn't matter how wide the pool is, you still feel the same pressure on your ears because it is determined by the depth under the surface. So if you see the levels here on these tubes are all equal regardless of the width because down at the bottom it's holding up a certain amount of fluid. What's happening here? Well, gravity is pulling on the water. And if I were in a room with you all now, I would ask you, what direction does gravity work in? It's the trickiest question of the evening. It's vertical. And so the force that is creating the pressure on my ears is only acting vertically. And so the change in pressure is going to be determined by the vertical height of water above me. And that is why in Eurodynamics, we use the unit of pressure as centimeters of water. We're talking about the number of centimeters of water that that pressure will hold up above me. Or if you like, if we're in a bladder, that you hold up above the bladder. If you had a tube of water connected to the bladder, how high would that tube be? That's what we're saying. And you can see here that we've got an equivalence with a, a measurement that you know very well, millimeters of mercury. When that cuff is attached to your arm, say, and you're looking at the oscillation sound stopping because of blood pressure, blood flow stopping. Well, you're looking at how high a column of mercury can be supported by that pressure in the veins. It's the same principle. How high a column of fluid can be supported by the pressure that's generated at the bottom. So when we look at pressure in urodynamics, we use transducers to pick up that pressure. It's rather easier than working with columns of water and trying to measure how high they are. So our transducers are connected through a column of fluid and under your transducer surface, you've got one of these. It's a strain gauge. A strain gauge will bend according to the amount of pressure on the surface of it. And it doesn't matter what kind of transducer you have, actually. These other ones, there's an air-filled one and there's a micro-tip one here on the slide. They all have strain gauges in them. And however the pressure gets to that strain gauge, it's bending the strain gauge, changing the resistance of the wire that's on the gauge. I don't know if you can see on the slide here a zigzag wire going across. That is picking up the change in resistance of that wire as it bends. So as we look in our urodynamic system, we're trying to get the pressure from the patient on the right of the slide through the water column to the strain gauge, which is mounted in the center here. And that's the basis of the systems that we'll be showing you in a minute on the videos. We have a column of water carrying the pressure from the patient to the strain gauge, which we can then take off to our computer. Now, Marcus has already mentioned the two pressures we're looking at. One of them is the blue star, if you like. We called it PVES or vesicle pressure. And that blue star is changing, the pressure is rising and falling according to the amount of pressure surrounding it in the abdomen. And when the bladder starts to contract, we then have a bigger pressure inside the bladder. That purple arrow is the extra pressure generated by the bladder as it contracts. And that's really what we want to know about in urodynamics. 
What is the pressure generated by the bladder? What is the extra squeeze going on? Is the bladder functioning? Or is it a pelvic floor issue that's causing leakage? So we've got to extract that blue, uh, that purple arrow from the diagram here. And we do it by taking out those interfering red arrows on the edge from the blue star in the middle. Or if you like, by this equation, subtracting the abdominal pressure from the vesicle pressure. And that leaves us with the purple arrow, what the bladder is adding to this situation. I'll very briefly cover one issue that if you've done any urodynamics with water, you'll be aware is a problem. What is the effect of air in the system? Well, if I've got a water-filled tube here in the middle, it will pass pressure beautifully down it, like a, a whale shouting underwater to its friend, or those coins you hear dropped on the far side of a swimming pool really come through clearly, because water passes on pressure very well. If we have an air bubble in the system, then a pressure wave coming down the tube will meet the air bubble and squeeze it. It will contract. Water does not compress. That's why it passes on pressure so well. But air in the system does compress, and so you get a smaller pressure at the end. So we want to get rid of the air, and that's what the syringe is doing in the system. It's flushing through the water to get rid of all that air in the system. I'll finally, in terms of physics anyway, uh, just comment on the position of the pressure transducer. And we'll see a video of that in, in this in a minute. If my pressure transducer is at this level on the top, reading 20 centimeters of water, it means in a water-filled system that the pressure at that level in the patient is 20 centimeters of water because the water column carries the pressure from the patient to the transducer. If I bring the transducer down to this second position, eight centimeters lower, I have now added an eight centimeter column of water onto my transducer. It's got eight more centimeters pushing down on it. And that means that the pressure is greater. So the reading on my pressure transducer will be greater in this position. It means with water systems, we've got to be very careful that we get the transducer at the correct height, because remember, it is reading the pressure at the level of the transducer in the patient. I'll show you some pictures of this in a minute, and hopefully that will be clearer. We do, though, just mention at this point that the standard reference height is the upper edge of the symphysis pubis. It's essentially a bony marker for the bladder. And we want to know the pressure inside the bladder, so we start from that point. Marcus also mentioned zeroing to atmosphere. And I merely want to point out at this stage that there are some practices that we discourage because it is non-standard. And these situations will give rise to the wrong pressures being read. These two situations here, for instance, if you can make sense of the diagrams, you can see that those taps are open to somewhere else when you look at the dome. Pressure from somewhere else can get into the dome and affect your reading. If, however, I cut off the patient side and cut off the syringe side from the dome, then I can hit zero because it is only atmosphere that can reach the dome in this case. So the top two, if you hit zero at that point, you don't really know what you're calling your reference point. One of them might be to the patient. One of them might be a bit of a squeeze on the syringe, both raising pressures to some point that you don't actually know what the value is. Only in the bottom one here can you be sure what your pressure is. It's atmosphere. It's the surrounding pressure, which is, of course, what surrounds our bodies and therefore makes sense to use as our reference point when we measure the pressure inside. Just perhaps to clarify that, 
I'll finish off with this issue about zeroing while you're connected to your catheter or water filled tube. What happens here? Well, we've got our syringe cut off from the dome and we've got our water filled tube cut off from the dome. So I can wave it around the room if I like. And there's no effect from the tube onto my transducer dome here. It means that if I hit zero now, I'm correct because I'm only measuring the atmospheric pressure at the time. What happens when it's in the patient though? What happens when your patient squeezes in this case? Well, the pressure would come up the water tube, but it would not get to the dome. I've still got atmosphere only on my dome. So that's fine too. Where we get a problem is where we have this tap open to the patient. If I zero in this situation, then I really don't know what the pressure is. I don't know what I'm calling my baseline, my reference point, because I'm inside the patient. What's the pressure there? Well, actually, I don't know yet. So if I call that my reference, I'm operating from an unknown basis. The rest of my pressures will not make sense. So in summary, this very brief tour through physics has given you an idea, I hope, of pressures and transducers and what we're measuring. You've got the idea that air bubbles are wrong and that reference height is right and that zero is a necessity. So what I might do at this point is just give you a chance to uh, fire any questions through the chat window and I'll see if uh, I can answer those for you. And uh, if you want to raise your hand at some point, then I will also try and uh, keep track of that. I'll just give you a minute to get to your keyboards or to digest the, uh, the physics. Hi, uh, I'm a urology registrar at Midway Hospital. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, uh, thank you for the explanation of the physics. Yeah, uh, very good explanation. And uh, I just want to know, while we zeroing in, well, we start with uh, inserting the catheter uh, uh, or the tube, the filling tube inside the bladder and one in the rectum. And uh, before we start filling, that's when we need to zero in or off while it's filling inside the bladder. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question because um, it does change a little according to which equipment you've got. Some pieces of equipment force you to zero before you even start recording and some you can zero while you're recording so you can mark it on your screens. We actually uh, use the zero marked while we're recording before we start filling and it means we've got a record on the trace that zero was done. But the important point to really answer your question here is that whenever you zero, it doesn't matter where your catheter is. As long as you've got the tap that connects to the patient, shut off to the patient. Because then your patient pressure is not affecting your dome, it's just atmosphere. So it doesn't matter when you zero, as long as at the point you zero, you're cut off from the patient. But uh, how can I uh, fill the bladder if I if I block uh, uh, if I block the pressure coming back from the bladder to the transducer? Right, um, that's a very good point because it uh, shows that we haven't explained that we are using two lines into the bladder. So mm -hmm. thank you for giving me the chance to clarify. Okay, we have two lines. One is measuring the pressure, and that's the one that we shut off for zero. Yeah. The other one is filling. And yeah. you can have these as two separate lines going in, or you can have what's called a double lumen line. Yes, the double lumen. Okay, yeah, good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right. Uh, I can't see any more hands up as yet. So let me move on, if you like, to the videos, if that's okay. Good. So um, Rob is kind of going to take us through one or two of the videos that we've got to look at setting up equipment. And this hopefully will uh, fill some of those other gaps that I've uh, clearly left in the uh, presentation so far. The first one that we're going to do, there's a, there's a series of these, we'll have the chance to answer questions between them. 
Um, the first one is setting up the flow meter. We're going to go through three different videos of the different aspects of setting up the machine. And the first one is setting up the flow meter. So if we can just run through this, I'll let you start it, Rob. Thank you. OK, let's start again. Flow Before meter. the function comes in, we'll also be able to set up the flow meter. We've got the meter here on the pad underneath the commode ready and my empty jug which I can place on there and have the funnel in place. Close that up and now I have the system ready for testing. And probably every week or so it's a good idea to check that the flow meter is calibrated. I've got 300 mils in this jug and I'm going to pour it in to the flow meter, pouring it in quite slowly so that it mimics urine flow, and make sure that the whole amount is poured in. I can then check on my screen that actually 300 mils, or thereabouts, plus or minus uh, 10 or 15 mils is registered correctly as the volume. Another way to do this, of course, without the measuring jug is just to check after the flow, the study has been completed, that the amount on the screen and the volume that's in the jug match up. Great, thank you. So we're, we're starting with the, uh, the simple end, the flows, which is sometimes done just as a uroflowmetry clinic and the same checks apply. You want to make sure that the volume and the reading match up. Setting it up for a man would obviously be on a standing uh, commode or a standing funnel with the flow meter on a little uh, stand underneath it. But we don't always assume that the man wants to avoid standing up. It may be that some of them prefer sitting down and we'll always ask that. If there's a question about it, we'll say, would you prefer to avoid sitting down? It depends on their personal situation and preference, of course. So the flow meter is one thing that's simple enough to set up. Perhaps we'll show one more video on another simple aspect before throwing it open for questions. This one is setting up the pump. We have a pump that is calibrated to put in a certain volume at a certain rate into the patient and We've just got a short video here on setting up the pump. Now we'll mount the pump and the giving set so it's ready for the patient when they come in. I've got the giving set into the saline bag and to start with I'm going to give a squeeze to fill up the chamber halfway. I then open up the tube so that I can allow it to run through and fill up the whole tube so that I'm not putting air into the patient. And when it's coming out at the end, I can seal that off and bring it over to mount onto the pole, which we have above the machine here. Now what I've got to be careful of is that my pump set goes the correct way through the pump itself. And you can see that there's an arrow on here going from the bag to the patient. So I've got to make sure that from the bag to the patient is going the right way through. And once I've got it in place, I'll just settle it into the pump so that when I close it, there is no kink inside or on the sides of the tube here. Now I've got that hung up and ready for the patient when they arrive. On some machines, you'll find that the bag is suspended on a weight transducer, and that measures the amount of fluid that has been pumped in by the difference in weight that it's measuring. In this case, the volume is measured by the number of revolutions of the pump. And we normally find that's perfectly accurate enough. So there's no weight transducer required for the bag. It is simply volume computed by the pump revolutions. So um, are there any questions at this point? Put them in the chat or uh, raise a hand and we'll try and um, answer whatever questions you've got. We, we've started the very simple end, hopefully it's straightforward enough for you. The fluid that we're putting up, just while you're thinking, uh, is of course uh, saline in that case, but if you're doing video urodynamics, you'll be putting up 
contrast media, which is slightly more dense and it changes your calculation slightly. But uh, that will be in a bottle and you'd have the same giving set. So the procedure is the same. You want to make sure that the line is full of water, so you're not pumping air or, or fluid, pumping air into the patient. You don't want to do that. And uh, for your flow meter, you want to make sure that it's all set up and ready because some of our patients, when they need to go, they need to go. And so you've got to have it set up and ready. Good, no other questions there, that's fine. Let's move on then to the pressure transducers. And this tends to exercise the mind a bit more when we're talking about taps and syringes. So we'll run a video which is filling and mounting the water-filled transducers. Before the patient comes into the room, we can set up the urodynamic equipment with the domes on top of the transducers. And the key thing when we do that is to make sure that the dome and the tube are full of water with no air left in. So I have my dome connected to the tube already and a syringe filled with water, which I'll keep upright so that all the air bubbles stay on the top. And now I'm going to move the taps so I can flush all the way through to clear the air bubbles out. And as I do that, I'll hold it over a receptacle so that I can make sure that all the water falls out neatly. And as I do this, I'm doing it slowly so that the air can come out of the dome and then switch it off so it doesn't leak out and fit it onto my first channel here. And I'll do the same with the second channel. Again, I have a dome ready with the tubing fitted and keep it upright so that all of the air bubbles flow through. I'll keep my finger on the back so that I don't damage the rubber by pushing too hard or you may have the cap still on. And flush it through. and now fit the second channel on here. Make sure it clicks so we know that it's in position. Now at this point I'll also give the system another flush to the side just in case there are any bubbles that have appeared in the dome. I can't see any but just in case I'm going to flush to the side on each one before I close off the syringe. And again here flush to the side and close off the syringe. Now I know that my tubes and my domes are completely filled with water and there's no air bubbles at all inside. Great, thank you. So hopefully you were able to see the position of the taps there. That's often an issue, but uh, the key is that the water can flow through when you're flushing and is open to the patient only when you're recording. You'll find that there's a, a handout for this workshop and all those uh, positions of the taps are printed out and clearly labelled in there. So make use of that for future reference and, and revision if you want. I mentioned during that that there's a cap on the back. It's normally on those transducers, a little sliding white cap that goes around the back. And I would normally flush through with that cap in place, just in case there's a, a bit of extra pressure pushing the, the rubber, as I mentioned briefly. So uh, just bear that in mind. You can be better off using the cap. The other question that is often asked in this case is when people see the syringes underneath the domes and they say, am I doing it wrong or do you do it differently? And the answer is we do. And it doesn't matter. That's the main message. Whether you have your taps uh, above your syringe or on the side or on the top, actually it makes no difference at all. Because if you remember, it's the position of the transducer relative to the patient that is uh, recording, is, is bringing your pressure reading into the machine. It doesn't matter where the syringe is, up the top or bottom. I'm going to uh, move on now quickly to zero, if that's all right, before we have a chance for questions, because uh, I'm conscious of time and this is an important issue, deals with taps as well. So uh, Rob, if we can run the, uh, sorry, the checking calibration is the one first, isn't it?
Let's do that first, I beg your pardon. Now we've got the pressure set to zero, and my p vers and p ad are reading atmosphere pressure as zero, I can open up the taps to the patient and see that I am indeed picking up pressure as I raise and lower these water-filled tubes. I can use these tubes to check the calibration of my water-filled system. I've got a marker on the wall here that is at zero centimetres marker, and I'm just noting the pressure at these points. It says six centimetres of water on both channels. So if I raise my water-filled tube up, I should see an additional pressure on the lines. And I've got a marker here that is 50 centimetres above that starting point. And you can see that my pressures here are 55 or 56, which is indeed 50 centimetres above where I started at 6. So I've now confirmed that my system is within calibration because a change of 50 centimetres height in my water-filled tube gave me a change in reading of 50 centimetres on the screen. My calibration check is complete. I'll make a small note of that in my log so that it is recorded for future reference. So hopefully that underlines the point that I made earlier about the heights of uh, water-filled tubes being equated to pressure. When you raise up the end of the tube, you've got a higher pressure pushing down, and you can use that to check your calibration. Very quick, you could do it every day if you like. I would normally recommend perhaps every week or so. So you can do that quite simply. You don't need to call in your engineers or pay another physicist or get the company in. Uh, anyone can do that during the clinic or just before it. Uh, now, let's do that zero that I mentioned earlier, and I'll give a chance for questions after that. Let's look at zeroing to atmosphere. At the start of every aerodynamic test, we need to make sure that the system is zeroed to atmospheric pressure. That is the reference point for all of the pressures that we measure inside the body. We have to know what they're measured with respect to and the standard is to atmospheric pressure. So we need to get our transducers open to atmosphere and then get the software to register that as zero. In order to expose both transducers to atmosphere, we need to make sure that the syringes are cut off from the dome and also the patient connections, these water-filled tubes, are cut off from the dome so that neither of them can affect the pressure inside. When the taps are in this position, open to the side, it is only atmosphere that can reach the dome. Now that we're sure we have zero on the transducers, I can tell the machine that this is zero by using the button that says balance or zero all pressures. I hit the all button, and then you'll be able to see on the screen that p vers and p abt have now been set to zero and p det, which is the difference between these, will also be zero, of course. And now, whenever I turn my taps open to the patient, I will be reading pressure with respect to this zero point. So again, just to underline this, this is fundamental to getting good, reasonable pressure values with respect to atmosphere and we would uh, encourage you to make that part of your clinical practice if it is not already. Uh, challenge the status quo and uh, point out the ICS um, standards as well as the good reasons for uh, having a reference point that you know. Uh, we've got a couple more videos, but perhaps I'll give you a chance to fire any questions at this point. So use the chat or the uh, raise your hand if you like and let me know if there's anything else that you'd like on these issues, setting up the equipment, filling with water, checking your calibration and zero. Hello, can I ask a question? Please do, yes. Who, who's this speaking? Oh, it comes Dell. My name is Muda Sirwani. I work as a registrar in urology at Medway Hospital. Hi. Oh, uh, hi. So my, uh, well, there's a question. So it won't matter why we keep these transducers we have to keep it fixed for a particular patient. Why we have zeroed it in? 
Yeah, that's a good point, and you lead nicely into our next video, in fact. So uh, we're talking about the position of the transducer with respect to the patient once you open it to the patient. That's the next video to do with reference height. But the last one we had on zeroing is where we had the taps cut off from the patient. No pressure from the patient or the syringe could get to the dome. So in that case, it doesn't matter where your dome is because going up and down will make no difference to atmospheric pressure. But when you start connecting to the patient, that's when you really do need to take care of the level of your transducer. All right, thank you. Andrew, okay. is Bruno, yeah. can you hear me? I have a question. Um, this is so, Bruno speaking, yeah? Yes. Hi. Uh, you zero to atmospheric pressure, but when you open to the patient, your pressure transducer, it's going to read a pressure for vesicle and abdominal, right? Correct. Let's, I don't know, 40 centimeters of water, but your detrusor pressure should be close to zero. It should not be everything zero. That's true. Thank you very much. Um, when you open up to your patient, you expect with no detrusor activity, with uh, a resting pressure in the bladder, you expect that the bladder inside and outside has the same pressures. And therefore, the difference between them, which is PDET, should be round about zero. Um, we're going to come on to that, in fact, in Arturo's talk in a minute to see what you do during a test, how you check. But uh, that's a, a helpful point that uh, when you open up to the patient, you see some pressures, both front and back, but the difference between them should normally be zero or thereabouts with, with a, a few centimeters, perhaps, error in there. Yeah, you're aiming for zero on PDET to start with. Thank you. Now, in the interests of time and in the absence of other questions, I'm going to ask Rob to take us through that reference height video, please, to look at how we change it during the test. When we're measuring with water-filled systems, it's important that we get the level of the transducers right for the position of the patient. And the reference point that we use is the pubic symphysis bone. So when the patient is lying down, as here, I need to move these domes down to be at that vertical level. So I look at it just by eye, and I get the opening hole of the dome level with the symphysis pubis and tighten it up. And now I'm at the right level for measuring patient pressure. So once we've checked the catheters are in place and they're all functioning correctly, we'll be asking the patient, in the case of a man, to stand up for the filling phase. Or for the woman, we might have her standing up in order to do some stress tests. So when your patient is standing up, you want to make sure that you get the level of the symphysis pubis correct. Now it is up here, so I need to change the level of my transducers so that the whole of the outlet is level again with the symphysis pubis. And now we can carry out the stress tests. For our male patients, we'll be filling and voiding, most likely in the standing position, with the flow meter mounted on a stand and a funnel in place. For the female patients, they'll probably only be standing for the stress testing to check for leakage. But we'll ask them mostly for filling and, of course, for voiding to be sat down on the commode. So when they do that, we're going to need to adjust the height of the transducers again to the level of the symphysis pubis, which is now down here. So I adjust the level until it is at the right place and tighten the transducer mount. Now we're ready for the voiding study. I'm often asked whether it's necessary to change the position of the transducers for every slight movement of the patient. And the answer is no. Normally my rule of thumb is that if the patient is changing position for more than one minute, then I will change the height of the transducers. But if it's only a short duration of the change of position, maybe just for a quick stress test, then I won't trouble the patient with trying to get the level sorted. I'll leave them where they are just for a short moment. But if it's for more than a minute, then I will change the height of the transducers so we can get the right pressure levels recorded. 
So that gives you, uh, again, just a bit of revision on the fact that we are measuring the pressures with our water filled system at the level of the transducer inside the patient. And that's where why we need to know where we are. We aim for that symphysis pubis level because that's where we're continuously measuring the pressure, whether the patient's standing, sitting or lying down. Now I'm going to uh, perhaps move on slightly quickly uh, to the last video if Arturo can uh, lend me a couple of minutes of his time because this is an introduction to uh, the quality control measures that he'll be talking about in more detail but it might be useful to see what it looks like on the screen of this equipment here. When we are starting the study we have checked that we've got zero, the transducers are at the right level for the patient, we want to know that we are measuring good quality signals. And the way we do that is shown in this video. Once we've checked the calibration of our system and we've zeroed to atmosphere, there are three tests for quality that we use before we start the test and at all points during the test. This trace here demonstrates them. The first one is the resting pressure. Once we've zeroed to atmosphere, the resting pressure inside the patient needs to be within standard levels. And for a seated patient, it would be around this, 26 centimeters of water on both lines, which means that your P-debt is pretty near zero because the resting pressures are equal. So that resting pressure is in the normal range and that quality check is passed. Another quality check is the existence of live signal, these small variations in pressure as our patient breathes or talks. And you should be able to see slight movements on each line that are almost perfectly cancelled out on the PDET. That assures you that pressure is being picked up from the live patient. So that's your second quality check passed. The third test is a cough or a valsalva move that you ask the patient to do. Here's a cough at the beginning and we can see that the spikes of the cough are equal on both lines, which is what we'd expect, and they are cancelled out on PDET. That is a good cough test and with all three quality checks accomplished we can then start the filling study. And throughout the study we would ask that the patient does a small valsalva or exhalation and another cough probably every minute or two, so that we can verify that pressure is being picked up still. And throughout, we would also measure those other tests of quality, the resting pressures and the live signal. If those continue throughout the test, you're confident of a good quality recording. So we're going to be looking at that very issue in more detail now as we go on to uh, start the test. And Arturo is going to be uh, taking us through running a test. Before we do that, is there anything else that people would like to cover over this theory and the, the setting up that um, I haven't done in enough detail for you yet? Just a chance to raise the hand or put something into the chat. We're now in the position where we've got the equipment set up. We know that it's measuring pressure and we're ready to go. And so is Arturo by the look of it. So no questions there. That's fine. We have 10 minutes at the end or however many minutes we have left by the end to throw any more questions out. So save them up for then. Uh, and I will keep an eye on the chat window too in the meantime. So I can introduce uh, Dr. Arturo Garcia Mora from Mexico, who's going to take us through running a test. Thank you, Arturo. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, thank you very much uh, to everyone. And it's very nice to be able to see you from the distance now. As Andrew said, now we're getting into everybody's homes and you're getting into mine. So uh, very glad to meet you. As Andrew kindly presented me, I'm a urologist from Mexico City. I had the privilege of training in functional urology in Bristol. And since then, I've been running this course with Andrew, Marcos, Laura, and Hashim sometimes, uh, for the uh, ICS meeting. So this is, these are my disclosures. And 
I am in charge of talking to you about how to run the test. So this means once the patient gets into the room, we finish the test and we talk to the patient about the results. And then you're going to be getting another talk about writing a report. But the, all, the, all the time we are with the patient, that's my talk for you. So we do have to remember all the time that the aim of urodynamics is to reproduce the patient's symptoms. So we need to make sure that we do everything during the test that ensures that we are able to reproduce the patient's symptoms. And I'm going to go through this uh, during my talk. So how does the course of the test go? First of all, the patient comes in, we do a brief interview where we need to be involved in what the patient's problems are. As I said, we need to reproduce the patient's symptoms during the test. And we can't do that if we don't have a good idea of what the patient uh, is complaining about and what their main concerns are, as well as the main concern of the person uh, sending us the patient to the test. Then we do a bladder diary analysis, and this is very important, both to know something about the pathophysiology of the patient's disease, but also to guide us through how are we going to be doing the test and what are going to be the, the volumes we're, looking, we're going to be looking for uh, during the, the same. Then we do a free flow with a dipstick test. I'm going to go through that after this. After the free flow, we do a physical examination, and this is mainly to uh, look at prolapse, to look at neurological signs, to look at the anal tone, to look at any physical abnormalities that might change the diagnosis we, we find at the end of the test. Then we do the catheter placement. Then we do, if you do, we do the urethral pressure profilometry. Uh, in Bristol, they do it for every patient. I can say that I do it selectively in Mexico. I use it for women with stress incontinence, women in retention, and men with post-prostatectomy incontinence. But it depends on your unit, how you're going to be managing it. Uh, it does give us uh, important information in some patients. So I recommend you do it uh, in, at least in some patients. Then we do the filling systometry, which comprises most of the urodynamic testing. Then we do the pressure flow studies, and then we do the report on the test. So this is an example of the bladder diary. I was telling you that this is going to give us very important information about uh, patients' storage symptoms, uh, urgency, frequency, nocturia, and actually this, this is crucial to make a good diagnosis of nocturia in every patient. But it is, it is also going to help us find what we're going to be looking for in urodynamics. For example, what does the bladder diary look like? First, we have the input, the amount of the amount of and type of uh, fluids the patient takes, and then we have the output. And with the output, you're going to be able to know what the, the 24 hour out, uh, output volume is. And very important, you're going to be able to know the functional bladder capacity. This is the largest amount of urine a patient can hold during the four days. And we're going to be able to know the average bladder capacity. We get the average blad bladder capacity by dividing the 24-hour volume be uh, between the, uh, the frequency with the patient had that day. And when we do the test, we need to aim to put into the bladder at least the average bladder capacity. What, did, what does this mean? That, that if the patient, for example, uh, we can see in the bladder diary that they have an average bladder capacity of 230 milliliters, and we're filling the patient during the test, and we, when we get to 100, they say they really need to void, then we probably should slow down the filling rate, and that is going to get us to at least the average bladder capacity the patient has. So this is very important because it is going to let us know what the patient is usually doing at home. Then we have to decide, we have already interviewed the patient, we already have the flow test, and we need to decide if we are going to be doing standard or video. In some units, for example, in Bristol, they already know uh, what the patient is getting. So they already have a referral letter and they know what the patient's problem is. So they sort out the patient either for standard or video and they have two different rooms where they do the test. But for example, in Mexico, I don't always get a, a referral letter or I don't always know what I'm going to get as a patient to when I do the test. So I always book for video because I need a special room to do the video urodynamics. 
I interview the patient, and if they don't need video, then we don't, we just don't use the room, and I do the, the standard urodynamics in the patient's uh, small room, as you can see there. For most patients, and in Bristol, this is 70%, and for me, it's about uh, 55, 60%, they get standard urodynamics. So this means the uncomplicated men with lower urinary tract symptoms get standard urodynamics. The uncomplicated woman with stress incontinence or an overactive bladder gets standard urodynamics. For, but for surgical failures, young men and women with voiding problems and any patient with neurological problems, then we do need to have video urodynamics. So this is the machine I have in my private practice in Mexico City. This is a, a, the, the, the place I do the standard urodynamics uh, in, in, in Mexico. This is a normal room. We don't have any sophisticated equipment. And this is the, the place where I do the video urodynamics. We have a large fl fluoroscopy uh, machine where, where we can do the women sitting and the men standing up a video urodynamics. So as I said, I decide this on the day of the test. So, so what does urodynamics include? We have storage urodynamics and we have voiding urodynamics. So storage urodynamics is mainly urethral pressure profilometry and filling systemetry. And for voiding urodynamics, we have uroflowmetry, which is not in, non-invasive, and we have pressure flow studies. So I'm going to go through all of this uh, in detail. So the first part is the free flow. We need to make sure that the patient has privacy to do the free flow, and this is our chance during the test to get the most natural uh, test we can. So we leave the patient alone. We have to have an adequate bladder volume. This means between 150 and 600 mils of urine inside the bladder. And we also use the sample to do a dipstick test and check for infection. So whenever the patient comes to urodynamics, they know beforehand they need to come in with a comfortably full bladder. So I usually tell them to drink about half a liter of water uh, one hour before getting to the test. And this usually gets them with a normal desire to void. So once they come in, they do the free flow, we do the dipstick test, I check the free flow, and then I do the, the physical examination. We do the physical examination after the free flow because it's just easier to go do, a, do the interview, leave the patient void alone. Then after they void, they change into the gown in, of the hospital. Then they lay down on the bed. We do a brief phys physical examination and then we get started by placing the catheters. The patient is lying down when we place the catheters. I, I usually first place the abdominal catheter with a non-sterile technique and then I uh, roll the patient to, to the back so I can do the vesicle catheter with a sterile or a clean technique. Uh, after, the pay, after, the, after the catheters are in, we flush the lines to remove any bubbles of air, as Andrew was explaining you before this. We place that transducers to the reference level. So remember, this is always the symphysis pubis. Then we zero the pressure in the machine. So the, remember always that the zero, uh, the, the pressure, the, the zero pressure is the atmospheric pressure, never inside of the bladder because you don't know what you're zeroing to, okay? So it's really important to zero to the atmospheric pressure. Then we check for quality control, which is a cough test. We ask the patient to cough or clear their throats. This is slightly different now uh, with the pandemic. Uh, I always ask the patient to leave uh, the mask on, and instead of doing vigorous coughs, I, I only ask them to uh, clear their throats, and that's usually enough to, to know that I am recording okay. And then I start recording. I'm going to go through this in a, in a small example. So what do we use to measure bicycle pressure? I, in Mexico, use the, the, a double lumen catheter, uh, and, I, and I use a seven French dual lumen catheter because it's just easier, and I don't get the, the correct gauge of the epidural catheter they use in Bristol. But this is the way they do it in Bristol. They have a UPP catheter, a single lumen UPP catheter, and they have a peridural catheter, which is fed in into the, as you can see here, into the holes of the UPP catheter, you put the tip inside of the holes, and then you feed both catheters inside. Once you get urine and you know you are inside of the bladder, <clears throat> then you dislodge the peridural catheter, 
And after you do this, you fill the rest of the peridural catheter inside. This is very useful because when the patient gets to the maximum systometric capacity, you can remove the UPP catheter and then the patient is left only with a very, very thin tube inside of the urethra and the pressure flow study you're going to get is much more uh, similar to a normal void the patient has. But uh, if you don't have this or it's more convenient for you to do the dual lumen catheter, then it's okay. You always have to use the smallest dual lumen catheter you can. Try to get a six or seven French. This is going to be the most useful thing. Over eight French, it, it is not recommended because it is going to interfere with the measurement in pressure flow studies. So this is the way you feed the catheter inside the UPP uh, line. And after you get into the bladder, then you dislodge this from the rest of the catheter and you can carry on with the test. This is the rectal catheter. And as you can see here, we always do a small cut in the balloon at the end of the catheter. Uh, most of the catheters we have now in the market come with this small uh, cut already done. But if yours don't uh, have this, this slit cut, uh, always do it uh, before inserting the catheter. Remember, the balloon is mainly designed to stop feces from blocking the catheter. If you don't do this small cut and you start purging and putting water into the rectal catheter, at the end, you end up measuring the pressure inside the balloon, not inside the rectum. So it's quite common to have people having trouble reading the abdominal line, and it's usually because they don't manage this correctly. So remember, always do a small cough, uh, a small cut, sorry. And once you flush water through the, through the catheter, it is going to come out of the balloon, go to the rectum, and you're going to be able to measure the pressure inside the rectum with no artifacts. So this is really important. So what do we use for infusion? We use normal saline when we do standard urodynamics or we use urographin or any alternative contrast you have in your unit to do a Euro, a video urodynamics. It is important to try to adjust the machine you're using for the different density of the, of the contrast media, because if you do video urodynamics and you have a, a disc uroflowmeter, it is not going to be exactly the same uh, density of the water, so you need to adjust this in your urodynamic machine. So things we need to consider, the patient position is very important. Men stand for doing the test, women sit for doing the test, and disabled patients may have to lie. Why do we do this? Because if we lie all the patients down or we, or we use the urodynamic chair, which is very convenient for us as urodynamicists, uh, then we, we might lose about 30% of the trusor overactivity just because remember, the patient doesn't live their life as, uh, lying down. So they walk, they stand up, they sit down, they move around. And we try, we try to do this during the test to reproduce the patient's usual activity. Uh, and the other thing is that we always have the patient either standing up over the flow meter or sitting down over the, over the flow meter. So this way we can catch any leaking of urine they have during the test. Technical aspects, the size of the catheters, we already discussed it, All, always try, try to use the smallest catheter available. The filling fluid temperature, we usually do it at room filling temperature, never use cold water. Uh, if you are in a place where the room is really, really cold, you, you might want to warm up the water a little bit, but there is no need to do it routine, uh, to do this in, in every patient and in every day. The speed and degree of bladder filling is different for every patient. We usually use 30 mils per minute. If you have a neurological patient, always start slower with 10 mils per minute. And if you have a patient with a bladder over 500 mils, then you can probably fill them up with 50 mils per minute. Remember, this is also important from the bladder diary. We usually fill the patient at, uh, we divide by 10, the maximum bladder capacity, and that is the, the speed we, we can use to fill up the bladder. But as a general rule, I usually start at 30 mils per minute and then, then take it from there. If they have a lot of the truth or overactivity, I slow down the filling rate. If everything is going well and they have a large bladder, I can go up to 50 mils per minute. Remember to fix the catheters very well because they might move during the test. 
So this is a, a thing I did with a patient. This is not what we usually do, but I did it so you can see what happens before we hit start on the machine. Most of the machines you're going to find in the market, you're able to do whatever you have to do, zero, uh, flush the lines, uh, check quality control, adjust the height and everything before you start uh, recording the, the trace. So in this case, as you can see here, this, this left part of the trace is usually not seen. I recorded it just to make sure you could, you could see what we do before. So before we start recording, we need to put the lines in, flush the lines, then zero, then do a, a cough test. And as you can see here, I have a larger reading in the, in the vesicle line than in the abdominal line. So I flushed again the abdominal line. I did another quality control and, I, and now I have good reading in both lines, a symmetrical cuff in both lines. And this is the moment I hit start on the machine. After this, the machine is going to be recording everything. <clears throat> and this is going to be shown in the printed test. So, I'm um, sorry, this was supposed to be moving. So from here to here, then this is going to be seen in the printed test. So remember, as Andrew said, you need to zero again here. So I can see if I get a trace you did in the UK or you did in Croatia or you did anywhere in the world, I can see that you zeroed to atmosphere when I get this trace in Mexico. So this is quality control and this is very important. So all of us who do Eurodynamics can make sure that the trace we're reading is is, is reliable. We, we know that you zero to atmosphere and then you did a cough test again. And I can see that everything is reading symmetrically and I can rely on everything that comes after this. Okay. So this is not recorded. This is recorded. So we need to zero two times before we record and after we record. Okay. Ah, now it worked. So this is what I see in the printed test. Okay. So the first part of the test is the UPP, the urethral pressure profilometry. This is described as the amount of, well, the maximum urethral closure pressure is described as the amount of pressure you need to apply to the bladder in order to open the wall of the bladder, the, the lumen of the bladder. This is the machine they used in Bristol when I was there. So this is a very practical, very a uh, movable uh, machine that it only pulls the catheter out at a rate of two millimeters per second. This is the one that comes with a lot of the machines we have already. This does exactly the same as this, but this is a little bit more inconvenient because we need to be moving the whole machine and the whole cart uh, uh, next to the patient. And this looks a little bit scary to the patient. You always have to let them know that this is not going to be touching them, okay? So this is what we do in UPP. We have a syringe driver, usually attached to the 60 mil syringe. We apply steady pressure and a steady infusion of one milliliter per second uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this line, one to two millimeters per, milliliters per second. And we start pr applying pressure here. And this goes through the filling line of the catheter. And as you can see here, we have two side holes in the UPP catheters, which are usually between five and 10 centimeters from the tip of the catheter. And with the puller, we start to pull the catheter at a rate of two millimeters per second. And we pull the catheter, and this is going to be measuring the amount of pressure we have in this place while we are removing the catheter and we are going to be able to measure the pressure we need to apply to open the urethral walls, okay? So this tells us the, how the muscle of the urethra is, is doing. So what is that criteria for quality control of pressure recordings? Remember, I don't know, I can't remember if Marcus said this or uh, Andrew did, but we always have some pressure inside of us. We never have zero pressure inside of the abdomen. So the resting values for abdominal and intrafacycle pressure are in a typical range. If the patient is lying down, we might have five to 20 centimeters of water. If they are sitting, we might have 15 to 40 centimeters of water. And if they are 
standing, we usually have 30 to 50 centimeters of water. We need to have cuffs every regular intervals, usually one minute, and immediately before and after boiling. This helps us to make sure that the, the, the pressures were reading correctly in different parts of the test. If I have a cough at the beginning of the test, but I don't have a cough through the rest of the test, I don't know if at some point the, the abdominal line became blocked with feces and it's not reading. So I can't rely on what I'm looking at in the test if I don't have a quality control every minute. Remember now with the pandemic situation, we usually ask the patient to, have to just clear their throats and not have vigorous coughs um, every minute. So before filling, vesicle and abdominal pressure should be positive. We should never have negative pressures inside of us. And this is in a range of between five and 50, depending on the patient position. The trusor pressure should be slightly above zero in a range of minus five to plus 15 centimeters of water, usually somewhere between zero and 10 centimeters of water. Theoretically, we should have exactly the same pressure in the bladder and in the rectum. In reality, sometimes we have slight differences between the two pressures. So we might have a detrusor pressure with, which is negative. Remember, the detrusor pressure is not a real pressure. It is a mathematical pressure. So you might have a, a detrusor pressure of minus one because of a slight difference between the cycle and abdominal line. If you have an, a difference between these two uh, measurements, the most important thing is that you check that when the patient coughs, you have exactly the same amount of increase in vesicle and in abdominal pressure. And during filling, there is no reason why PVS or PF should decline. If something goes down, if vesicle pressure starts going down, then we have some artifact in the machine. We might have a nerve bubble, we might have the patient standing over the one of the lines. So make sure something uh, is not happening because we need to try to avoid artifacts. We might get our artifacts and that's okay. But if you suspect something is wrong, then don't go on with the test, fix the artifact and then carry on with the test, okay? It is not bad to have sometimes some strange thing happening during the test, but it is wrong to continue doing the test in spite of, of identifying this uh, abnormality, okay? So this is an example where you can see we ask the patient to cough here. We see an increase in the cycle line, which is much larger than we have in abdominal line. So we flush the line. We ask the patient to cough again. We see exactly the same thing. We flush exactly the same thing as you can see here. Then we check what is going on. We might have, for example, a bad connection in abdominal line. We check the connection, we flush again, and as we can see here, then the, the measurement is correct between the cycle and abdominal line, and we can carry on with the test after this point, okay? Remember, during filling, we need to check pressures. We need to reproduce symptoms. This is very important. If the patient comes to us because they complain about having stress incontinence, we need to look for stress incontinence. This means not just a couple of coughs and they don't leak, so then, okay, they didn't leak. No, we need to stand them up, we need to crouch, we need to reduce the prolapse in order to look for this stress incontinence because this is the main aim of urodynamics. Maybe we find that we ask the patient to cough and the cough uh, makes the bladder have a, a detrusor overactivity wave and that's what makes them leak. We didn't find where we were, we were thinking we were going to find. We actually find the trusor overactivity incontinence, but the patient cough and then she leaked. So we reproduce the patient's symptom. This is very important to be, to, for us to look for the symptoms with the patient. We need to change the feeling speed according to the test. As I was saying, I start at 30 mils per minute, but if I get a lot of the trusor overactivity, I go down at 20. If I start at 30 and I see the bladder is stable, we don't have any compliance issues and everything is going okay, I might speed up at 50 mils per minute if I know the, the patient has a, a very large bladder. We need to check for compliance. This means we need to check for a, a steady increase in the trusor pressure. And if I start getting an, a, a steady increase in the trusor pressure, I need to stop the infusion 
check if this increase in the pressure stabilizes and doesn't continue to go up and then carry on filling up the patient. We need to make sure that this is not an artifact introduced by the speed of filling. Uh, during voiding, remember voiding or pressure flow studies is a voluntary contraction. If I have a patient that I am filling up and do, I am doing a filling systemetry, and they say, I need to go to the toilet and I see a detrusor overactivity wave when they have a desire to void, and I decide to start a pressure flow study at that point, I'm giving the patient permission to have the detrusor overactivity incontinence. That is not a voluntary contraction. That is not a pressure flow study. So what I need to do is if I see a detrusor overactivity wave, I stop the infusion, I ask the patient to squeeze, to try to hold. I, I give the patient some seconds, a couple of minutes, so they can bring down the contraction. We get the trusor pressure as we had it before the detrusor overactivity wave. And I ask them again, do you need to go to the toilet now? If they say yes, then I can start a pressure flow study. If they say no, then I can carry on feeling and the desire they had to void was urgency derived from a detrusor overactivity wave. So we need to be very careful to do a real pressure flow study and not let the patient have detrusor overactivity incontinence. And remember for voiding, we need to have a cough before and after voiding. And this enables me to know that I'm reading correctly before and after I see the whole of the pressure flow study, okay? So this is an example of, uh, of a test, what you should be looking for during the test and what you, uh, what you should be doing during the test. This is the free flow. And as you can see here, we have a voided volume of 286 milliliters. So this is representative. This is something I can, I can rely on. Then after this, I have the filling systemetry. In this brand of machine, we have this blue line here, which indicates we are filling. And when this changes to yellow, this means voiding. So I already did what I had to do before this. I zeroed, I flushed, I checked for quality control. And after I do that, I start recording. And after I start recording, you can see here, I zero again. I show everyone that this machine is zero to atmosphere. I ask the patient to cough. I have a cough here. Well, this is the zero. I have the initial cough in here. And every minute I ask the patient to cough. I need to do annotations in the test. So this is the trusor overactivity. And this is annotated here. This is again, the trusor overactivity. And in here, I note the first desire to void. As you can see here, there, this is a gap in filling. This is another gap in filling. So whenever I get the trusor overactivity, I stop the infusion. I wait for the detrusor overactivity wave to come down. Then I feel again. I get another detrusor overactivity wave. I stop the filling. The detrusor overactivity wave is over now. And the patient lets me know that they start to feel the bladder is filling up. So this is the first desire to avoid. And this is real because they don't have the trusor overactivity. I carry on filling the patient. When I get to 200 milliliters, I do the cough tests so I can check for stress incontinence. Then I carry on with the filling again. I have the trusor overactivity. I have a leakage here, which is not seen on the machine, but I saw it during the test. So I need to annotate the leaking here. I get the normal desire to void another detrusor overactivity wave. And as you can see here, I stopped the infusion. And after the detrusor overactivity wave came down, then the patient said they needed to void. This is the actual maximum systematic capacity. Okay. So remember a cough before voiding. This is a slight clearing of the throat before voiding. Then the patient voids, and I have another cough after the void. So I know everything measured from here to here is reliable. Remember, this is going to cause an increase. This is this decrease in abdominal pressure is this increase in the trusor pressure. So we need always to look. This is going to be checked by uh, interpretation, which is a very important talk. But you really need to look at the three lines here. If you have a decrease in here, 
this is going to be reflected as an increase in here. So we need to look what's happening in all of the lines. When should we repeat the test? If the initial test suggests an abnormality and we're not sure what we found, if, sorry, if the initial test leaves the cause of the troublesome lots unresolved, and if there are technical problems preventing from proper analysis. So we need to tailor the test. Remember, we need to check the bladder diary to know the expected systematic capacity. If we have a patient that has a lot of the trusor overactivity, we lie them down so we can fill them up and we can carry on doing the test. We need to take into account the voiding position, and this is very important for men to stand up and women to sit down. We need to change the filling speed. We need to run the water as provocation when we're looking for the trusor overactivity. And it, we really need to look for, for stress incontinence if that is the troublesome lots the patient is having. So cough while sitting or standing, crouch the patient, reduce the prolapse, make them jump even during the test and do the Valsalva leak point pressures. At the end of the test, remember, we need to remove all the catheters we need to empty the residual if, you were, if you're using contrast media. We need to explain the results to the patient and you need to fill out the report. Thank you very much for your attention and we have some time for questions. And please, this, these are some pictures from Mexico City and thank you again very much. Arturo, thank you very much for taking us through that. Um, we do have a chance for some questions now if there are uh, points that you want to put to Arturo and uh, put them in the chat window or feel free to uh, raise a hand if you can find the button for that. The other thing that we'll be doing uh, after the chance for some questions is just having a very short break. It'll mean that you've got permission to leave your screen or get away and do whatever you need to do. We'll just have a, a couple of minutes for that. In the ICS meetings, we'd normally have half an hour but uh, we figured that wasn't necessary in this case. You can just uh, take a little bit of time to refresh your teacup or whatever you need. But in the meantime, if there are any questions, please just fire them. Yeah, Omar, please ask your question. Hi, uh, my question is, is about uh, abdominal leak point, uh, leak point pressure and urethral uh, closure pressure. And I understand we don't do that as uh, as often in males because, well, if there is a need after TERP or after radical cystectomy or whatever reason. But if we do it in, in females, uh, when would it be the the most uh, uh, appropriate time? At the end of the filling or we do it at a different test or when do we do that exactly? Thank you for your question, Omar. Uh, well, for the maximum urethral closure pressure, what we do it, uh, how we do it and how they do it in Bristol is we usually do it beginning the test. You don't need to have a full bladder to do uh, a UPP. So it's just easier to have the patient lying down, uh, move the machine through uh, close to the patient and we can do the urethral pressure profilometry at that point. For the Valsalva leak point pressure, what we usually do is we stop at 200 mils and we do a first Valsalva leak point pressure. And um, if we don't get any leaking during coughing, any leaking during an exercise at 200 mils, then we tend to repeat it when we get to the maximum systematic capacity so we can see the stress incontinence. But for the actual Valsalva leak point pressure, we stop at 200 mils and then look for it at that point. How I usually do it I, I, is I give the patient a 20 mil syringe and I ask them to blow into the syringe as if they are trying to uh, push the, the syringe driver uh, outside of the syringe. And that way I get a steady increase in abdominal and cycle pressure and I, I am able to obtain the Valsalva leak point pressure. Thank you very okay. much for your answer. So, Thanks, uh, Arturo. There's another question for Arturo from Andrew Hextall. Yep. When and how to measure in patients with, with prolapse? Well. I, I tend to decide on, on prolapse uh, depending on what, the, on, on what the question is. Remember, we, we might get a referral for urodynamics uh, for prolapse. And if the question is, is this patient obstructed from having a prolapse, then I don't reduce the, the prolapse in the first test. I do a first urodynamics 
with the prolapse uh, not reduced. I ask them to void with the prolapse outside, and that way I can answer the question if they are obstructed or not because of their prolapse. On another hand, I might have a patient that the question is, uh, will I get stress incontinence after correcting the prolapse? And they are already going to correct the prolapse. So I don't care very much on how everything is working with the prolapse outside. I need to know what is going to happen once they get the prolapse reduced and operated on. So what I do is I use a, a pessary from the beginning of the test. I I reduce the prolapse and I do exactly the same as I would do in, in every patient. I do a UPP with the prolapse inside. I do a Valsalva leak point pressure when I get to the 200 mils. I do the cough tests when I get to the 200 mils. And if I do get the incontinence at 200 mils, I carry on with the test and I do the pressure flow study. If I don't get leaking at 200 mils, then I look again for leaking with coughs uh, at maximum systematic capacity. Sometimes, as I said, I need to do the, the test twice in patients with prolapse, one with a patient with a prolapse not reduced and the other one with the prolapse reduced. It depends on what they are asking for during the test. Okay, thank you. We have uh, Andrew waiting for a question as well. Okay, thank you very, very good talk. I, I really enjoyed it. I was just asking about the filling rate. I mean, some units I've worked at, they, they fill at 100 mils per minute. I mean, filling rates of, of less than 50, um, I mean, even those are super physiological and it's much quicker than the bladder would fill up normally. So why don't you just fill up much quicker? It's probably more provocative. You might see more diffuser activity. You get through the test quicker. Um, I mean, there's a number of advantages. What do you think? Exactly as you say, it, it depends on what you're looking for during the test. And most patients, you need to try to reproduce the, the symptoms as much as you can. And if you fill up at 100 mils per minute and you get low compliance or you get increased sensibility or you get the truth or overactivity, you'll never be able to know if this is introduced by you or this is a real patient problem. So I would advise on never filling up at 100 mils per minute. But if you have a patient with a very, very large bladder, uh, I mean, 1,000 mils, 800 mils, and you fill them up at 15 mils per minute, then you're going to be spending all your morning with one patient. So probably it's safe to start at 30 mils. If compliance is doing okay, PDET is doing okay, then I go up to 50 mils per minute. I wouldn't go uh, faster than that. Uh, regardless of any any type of bladder I have. I, I would say 50 mils per minute is the fastest I would feel a patient uh, in, in regular circumstances. Okay, well, I'll make that just over a minute, and uh, I hope that that's given you enough time to refresh yourselves. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Laura Thomas now, who's our lead clinical scientist and manager of the urodynamics department, to uh, take you through some troubleshooting. This is now urodynamics in practice. So I've been asked to um, talk to you through the basics of troubleshooting. Um, this will take two forms. The start of this will go through a bit of the theory behind troubleshooting. So hopefully help you recognise uh, what they look like in terms of the artefacts that you might see on a urodynamic trace and then how you would troubleshoot those during the test. The second part will be some live videos um, that I will hopefully have some help from the audience on in terms of understanding what's going on and how you would rectify them if it was your test. So there is a lot of repetition in these slides. If we're all saying it, it's probably because it's, uh, it's essential and it's something that's worth you knowing. So please bear with us if more, more than one of us has already said it. So the basics of troubleshooting, the, the concept of troubleshooting is that you need to be able to identify and recognize some of the artifacts and that you might see your, in your dynamics and, and what they would appear like on your trace. Um, as well as understanding what they look like, so a little bit of pattern recognition, um, you need to understand what's causing them. If you can understand the cause of the artifact, it will then help you understand whether there's any sort of remedial action that you need to take um, in order to rectify it. There will be a number of artifacts that you will be required to understand. Um, but need no 
no remedial action and there'll be others that you will need to act on immediately rather than waiting till the end of your test. So troubleshooting um, is done in accordance with your ICS quality control. So we've had lots of talk about this as we go, but I'm going to repeat it because it's important. So the quality control criteria uh, relates to the abdominal and intracycle pressures being live. So what we mean by that is that you're recording in real time from your patient. So your patient should be talking, they should be breathing. You'll get a little bit of fine definition on your trace, but you know that what you're looking at on your trace is what's going on inside your patient at that time. In order to check that your lines are working, so in ensuring that the quality of the trace is good in that both are recording appropriately, you can do cough checks. So a good cough test will show both of the cycle and the abdominal pressure at the same level, giving you a biphasic wave on your detrusor line. Um, some patients can't cough in COVID times. We are trying to, uh, to, to encourage people not to cough if possible. So blowing out, blowing into the back of your hand, any form of manoeuvre that will increase the abdominal pressure and therefore be picked up on both the abdominal and intracycle line is sufficient. And we talked about resting pressures. I think everyone has talked about resting pressures. So um, your abdominal and cycle resting pressures should be within an acceptable range. And that should therefore translate into an acceptable p -depth. So like Arthur has already mentioned, your p is a mathematically created pressure based on your p apt and your p -vers. Therefore, any issues that occur within your abdominal or your vesicle pressure will be translated into your detrusor pressure. So it's really important that you make sure that they're both recording reliably in order to be sure of what your PETA actually is. It's also important to remember that those uh, acceptable ranges are based on your patient. So Mark has made a point in the first talk about making sure that your test is based on your patient. Um, take a look at your patient as they walk in the room. You know, it, a very large patient will have a considerably higher resting pressure um, than a very slim patient. And bear that in mind when you're running your test. So not only does positional change uh, impact on your resting pressure, but so does your patient, your patient size. So in accordance with your ICS standards, if we're looking for equal transmission, uh, i.e. Your, your apt and your cycle line are recording well, and that your resting pressures are within acceptable ranges, then it would make sense that the things that are going wrong are that your resting pressures aren't within the acceptable range or that the pressure transmission is unequal. So one line is recording better than the other line and vice versa. We touched a little on changes in abdominal pressure in our Turo's talk. And it's really important to remember that your patient's body mass, your patient's weight, your patient's size, it doesn't change during this test. So any changes in resting pressure um, usually indicate that there's something going wrong or that maybe your patient is on the move. So we'll show you some of those uh, on some traces in a minute, but generally your resting pressure should remain the same. Sadly, it's not a weight loss test, so they should remain constant. Now, this is a slightly um, busy slide, so please bear with us. It's an, hopefully a step-by-step -step way of troubleshooting, so it might be useful for, for reference later on for those of you who are performing neurodynamics already. And like we've just said, the problem is either that your resting pressures aren't transmitting equally or that there's an issue with your resting pressure. And the way in which you troubleshoot those will be slightly different depending on what the initial issue is. If it's a resting pressure issue, then the first thing that we would suggest you check is that you've zeroed to atmosphere. Um, like we've said before, it doesn't matter if your catheter is already in your patient. If you are to flip those taps back to atmosphere, closing them off from the patient and off from the syringe, it should read zero if you had zeroed uh, correctly at the beginning. If it doesn't read zero, you can always read zero at that point. So it doesn't matter if you've started running your test already, if you have concerns and when you flip it back into the zero position, you realize that you have not zeroed, you can again at that point. If that works, fantastic, continue. If you've checked your zero when it's correct 
and you've still got issues with your resting pressure, then check the level of where your transducers are. So you should always have your transducers at the level of the synthesis pubis. So effectively, you're measuring the column of water above those transducers. A bit of a key tip here is if both of your resting pressures look abnormal, so if you've got a very tiny patient who's come in with huge resting pressures and it's on both the lines, then it's usually an issue confined to the placement of those transducers. If it's a single line, you know it's not necessarily the height of the transducer that you're interested in. So if it's as simple as that, fantastic, off you go. And if it's not, then you need to flush your line. Now, this is what you would start with if you had a poor response from a single line. So if you performed a cough test um, and have shown that one or, two, one or other of the lines aren't recording properly, or if you have an uh, abnormally flat line. So if your patient is communicating with you, which you, you hope that they are during the test, you will get fine definition. You will get movement on that line. Any flat line should be making you feel uncomfortable. So if that's what you've got, a poor cough response or no fine definition, then you also start with a flush. So as said, and again, apologies for the constant repetition, but a flush will remove an air bubble. It will do an awful lot more than that. If your taps are in the wrong position, a flush will either be difficult because you're blocking it off with a syringe, and you'll end up with water on your feet if your taps are open. If you've managed to trap the manometry line or the catheter has become kinked, it will be very difficult to flush the line. In patients for whom you've drained their bladder, so their bladder is very empty, sometimes the catheter becomes lodged against the wall um, of the bladder, occluding the lumen, making it very difficult to measure pressure from. So a quick flush will dislodge that. So a flush does an awful lot more than just remove an air bubble from your line. It gives you a number of bits of information and it also gives you a couple of minutes to steady yourself and work your way through the test. Um, it gives you a distraction for your patient and makes you look like you're, uh, you're trying to, to deal with the issue there and then. So it buys you a bit of time if nothing else. You flushed a line and it's worked. Fantastic. Continue. If you flushed a line and it still hasn't worked, then you need to look at the individual line. Okay, so my advice would always be that you follow that line back from the patient all the way back to the transducer. Because usually at some point there will have been um, an, an issue along it. So either your taps aren't in the right position or something hasn't been connected properly and it's leaking on the floor, um, or you've done a classic and you've rolled the x-ray machine over or you've caught it underneath the commode. There's something causing a blockage. And you will only know that if you follow it back from the patient to the transducer. And then we look a little bit more specific as to which line isn't working if, if this is still failed. So if it's a cycle problem, then sometimes just instilling a volume of water into the blood will work. It may be more um, to dislodge, but also it gives you a little bit of fluid in there to start measuring pressure um, better. If it's an abdominal issue, there is cases where we overfill the balloon so the rectal balloon, if you overfill it, so you flushed too much into it, um, sometimes it can distort the pressure because it will measure a, a balloon pressure as opposed to a rectal and therefore abdominal pressure. So sometimes you will, you will need to remove the water from that slight balloon. If all else fails, the only option often is to change the catheter. Um, very rarely do we have to change the transducer. It's usually a catheter issue. And that is the last case last case and worst case scenario. So with these sorts of things in mind, um, we're just going to look at a few basic traces and see if we can identify some of the artifacts on here. So first thing that I want to put, draw people's attention to are the resting pressures that you might see. So this is a scale of 100. Um, so they're slightly out in that your cycle pressure is slightly greater, but 10, 20, 30, maybe 35, and just above 30. So this gives you an idea of the sorts of positions that your patient is likely to be in. So maybe seated, maybe slight and standing. There's a little bit of fine definition, although there's not much movement from your patient. And therefore, in order to check that the, the quality of this trace is good, the lines are both recording, you've got them to do a cough test. Now, you can quite clearly see based on this line that your abdominal line 
is reading higher than your vesicle line. So there's a dampness of your vesicle line. And therefore, this is the one that we've decided to flush. It hasn't produced a nice biphasic wave on your detrusor line, which is what you would expect if the height of your cycle and your abdominal reactions were the same. So a flush in your line is demonstrated by a rapid increase and then a rapid decrease in pressure. You need to make sure you turn your tap back into the correct position in order to start recording from your patient again. And once you have done anything to rectify the quality, you need to check it. There's no point doing it anything um, in terms of a remedial action if you're not going to check it. So you've had an issue, you've troubleshot it, you've worked out which line it is, you've performed some form of action to try and remove an air bubble. That's what you're thinking it's likely to be if this is dampened. And the outcome is a lovely cough test with almost no response from your detrusor line. And then you can continue. So Another example of when the lines aren't reading equally would be when you lose the catheter completely. So again, I wanna just bring attention back to your resting pressures. So your resting pressures are of around 60, which would imply that your patient is probably standing up, okay? There's a lovely element of fine definition in this trace. So there's some movement on both lines, which is subtracted out onto your detrusor. You've got a nice cough test demonstrating the quality of this trace is, is good to this point. And this continues throughout this part of the filling phase. Now, just before we've given the patient permission to void, which is what happens in this voiding phase, as you can see clearly marked here at maximum systematic capacity, there's some very short, sharp frequency spikes present on your abdominal and then also on the detrusor line at the bottom. And these are movement artifacts. So these short, sharp frequency spikes occur when you knock the line. Um, in this case, possibly as your patient was getting into the correct position to, to pass urine. So you've given the patient permission to void. They have initiated voiding. And at that point, you see this sharp drop on the cycle line to a level below zero. And this is the point at which the catheter has come out of the patient and is now hanging below the level of zero, so below the transducers and probably somewhere into your flow meter. Um, it's also, interestingly, the point at which the flow starts, indicating that maybe the catheter size you used was too large and forming a slight obstruction, um, making it difficult for this patient to avoid past. You've identified the issue the vesicle line has fallen out. Now, do you need to do anything? Is there any remedial action which needs to be taken? And in this case, if your urodynamic question relates to the voiding phase of urodynamics, then yes, there is, because you haven't actually been able to answer anything. If you're not interested in this patient's voiding phase and you were only interested in their storage phase, then um, it may not be troublesome for you. But if you want to understand their voiding behavior, it would be very difficult to answer any questions based on this because there are no pressure measurements within your cycle line during the voiding. The only thing you could maybe say is that they have emptied fully because you know that you put in 252 mils, it's based on the, the number up here, and they've voided at 465. But in terms of their pressures, we would be unable to comment. Therefore, the remedial action would be that you would need to recatheterize this patient. Um, increasing their risk of infection, increasing the length of the test and, and, and their sheer uh, discomfort. And then you would need to refill and repeat the voiding phase. So it's quite a lot of work. Um, and I encourage people to practice their taping skills to make sure that they keep their lines in as much as is physically possible. So another um, set of artifacts demonstrated on a trace would be the change in position uh, which would give you differences in your resting pressures. So not only do you get a shift in the resting pressure when your patient changes into different positions, so when they're led down, you'd expect it to be lower and then seated and then standing, you'd expect it to be higher again. The other giveaway are these short, sharp frequency spikes we've already talked about in the slide before. So if the change in resting pressure wasn't enough for you to be able to detect a movement, the physical um, act of moving knocks and lines, and this will often give you these sorts of movement artifacts. Now, again, um, I'm not asking you to do anything about them. I'm asking you to be aware of what they are. 
I am suggesting might be useful is that between each movement of your patient, so into different positions that you perform some form of quality check, so in this case, a cough test, um, just to make sure that lines haven't become dislodged at any point during the test, um, or that you haven't trapped them under something in, in the process of you moving this patient. Okay, and finally, in terms of um, picture artifacts, there's a few things to note on this slide. Again, we start on the left-hand side and we move through to the right. This is a section of the filling phase of urodynamics. We've got a really lovely cough test, which is cancelled out almost entirely on the Tachusa line, so you know that both lines are recording um, correctly. And then you start to get these basic waves present on the Detrusor line. Now, when you're considering a urodynamic trace, when you're interpreting, make sure that you interpret all three lines together, because this Detrusor line is just a mathematically created uh, line based on the two above it. Therefore, any issues, any artifacts that are present on the other two lines will be transferred into your Detrusor line. So take a look up at the fascicle line, which is sat in the bladder. So you know that this is almost a true bladder pressure in, in the sense that this is recording directly within the bladder. There are no smooth phasic waves there. These are coming from the abdominal line. Um, they're slightly more evident if you haven't put the rectal catheter in far enough um, and it's sat within the muscle, the muscular um, structure of the, of the anal canal. If you can pass it into the rectum, they're slightly less, less evident and they don't happen in everyone. There's nothing I necessarily need you to do about them, apart from please never overanalyze this as being any form of detrusor overactivity. Make sure that if you've got any concerns, you look at the lines above. The other artifacts that I want um, to bring your attention to are these very um, almost icicle looking structures on your cycle line. So these regular, which is the key here. Um, blips on your vesicle line, which are also apparent on your detrusor line, not on your abdominal line. They seem to occur in sync with you starting your filling and stopping your filling. And they're related to your pump artifact. So as soon as you start the pump, you will get these regular, because your pump is on a regular, on a regular basis. And as soon as you stop filling, that pump artifact stops. Again, it, it happens if you use double lumens, it happens if you're filling through a suprapubic. Um, it, it, it doesn't need any remedial action apart from you might need to stop the trace more regularly and measure your resting pressures because it may mask any underlying changes in your resting pressure, which are, um, you would normally note if you didn't have that artifact. So just stop filling every now and again, and make a note of your resting pressures and it will allow you to monitor any changes in them. If you were monitoring changes in your resting pressure here, you would also notice that you'd had a steady rise on your bicycle line as you fill. So that was a really interesting question earlier about why we don't we fill at 100 mils, uh, 100 mils a minute. And one of the reasons maybe in a neurogenic patient is that sometimes a higher filling rate can demonstrate a change in compliance, which isn't there. If you've got concerns, it's an artifactual change in compliance. You stop filling for two minutes and you wait and see if it comes back down to your resting pressure. If it does drop back down to resting pressure, so if this one, we'd stopped the filling and this had gradually drifted back down to 45 or thereabouts, we would then slow our filling rate back down for the remainder of the test. In some patients, however, they do have true issues with their compliance. And therefore, once you leave, the filling rate off for two minutes and it's maintained, you can be more confident about those changes in that patient's compliance. So the artifact there would be if you fill too quickly in some patients, you may see changes in their compliance, which, um, which wouldn't be there normally. So a couple of artifacts there, your rectal contractions, your pump artifact, and this change in compliance. So you'll be really pleased now that I've got some interactive slides. Um, so I've got a list of people's names if uh, no one fancies joining in on this, um, but I'd rather not have to pick on people. So if anyone wants to contribute, please feel free. If not, I'll work my way through the list of names I have in front of me. 
This is a trace uh, from a urodynamic test that, that one of us in Bristol has performed. I'm going to start to run it as it would be if you were running the test, and I will pause it at certain points to see what people's feedback on it is. Can anyone tell me what they would be doing at this point? If this was your urodynamic trace that you were running, what's everyone thinking? Which line is making you feel uncomfortable and why? This is really mean. I'm just going to go through the list. Oh, OK, Courtney, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're right. The Vesicle line is making is making me feel a little bit anxious and I'm glad it is for the rest of them. Therefore, what would you do? So if you've noticed that the Vesicle right line is reading slightly under, what would be the, uh, the initial action that you would take? Who hasn't answered? Flush it. Fantastic. Okay, so this chat box does work. You would flush it. So you would flush to either remove an air bubble, to buy you a bit of time, to work out why that line isn't working properly. You would flush it. Once you've flushed it, what would we then do to check that it's actually working? Cough. Brilliant. So that is the process of troubleshooting. It's actually really simple. You've identified that there's an issue. You've worked out what you're going to do about it. You're going to flush it. And then you're going to check afterwards that that has actually worked. So there's your flush on the recycle line. And there's some form of increase in abdominal pressure, which would give you an increase on both the abdominal and the recycle line. So if your patient can't cough, it might be a blow on the back of their hand or something that will increase the pressure in both that lets you know that it's working fully. Okay, so you're happy now that it's recording nicely. The last thing that is evident on this is what? So what's starting to happen now on the detrusor line? For those of you who can see that. So can everyone see that there's a decrease on the detrusor line? Yes, perfect, Nick. So your PVES, your detrusor is coming negative, fab. So for those of you who can see this, you've had a lovely resting pressure on your detrusor line and now you've suddenly got this dip in it. So you've suddenly got a decrease in pressure evident on your detrusor line, which hasn't come from your recycle line, so your recycle line is looking fairly flat. But there has been a rise in pressure on your abdominal line. So, you know, any change in pressure um, needs to be addressed on all three lines. This isn't important. It's just interesting to know that it's coming from the abdominal line and not the tissues line. In isolation, it's quite easy to see. But if these make up a large part of your test, sometimes that can be far more difficult to understand. And finally, just in order to check. Yes, Linda, that's fantastic. Fantastic you've got your cough test at the end to make sure that you're still happy that the, the lines are recording properly. Okay, everyone take a look at this one. This is the same one, this is different. Okay, so the second one is up. We're watching that come onto the screen. So we're happy that resting pressures appear okay at the beginning. So they look okay. We've zeroed to atmosphere here. You've got this cough test here. Which line is not working properly? Which line would people be thinking about needing to, to adjust? Yes, the recycle line. Easy. So you've identified that there's an issue. Your remedial action would be to do what? What will people be doing now? You flush it. Fantastic. And after we've flushed it, we're going to do what to check it? Cough. Fantastic. So let's see how that pans out. Oh. 
some slight technical issues. Okay, let's move on to the next one. So, same thing again, let's watch this one. You've zero to atmosphere, you've opened it up to your patient. Hopefully we're gonna see a cough test that we weren't happy with, there you go. So our action would be that we flushed it, rapid increase in pressure, rapid decrease in pressure. In order to check that has worked, we're gonna do a cough test. There's your cough test. You're happy that you've got a nice biphasic wave. And then as you start to fill your patient up, this is the pump artifact that you might get. Okay, so just to make you aware, this is what a pump artifact might look like. There's nothing you necessarily need to do. You just need to be aware that you want to stop every now and again and check your resting pressures that's sitting underneath that. We've got one final one before I hand over to Marcus. So let's just have a little look at this one. Okay, so it's on, it's recorded from our patient. It was a good cough test. And then what's happening? Okay, so this is what starts, starts to happen during your test. What's the first thought? It's the first thing that anyone would be concerned about. It's on both lines and it's a change in your resting pressure below zero. So if your catheter has come out, it would be both catheters at exactly the same time. So it's, it's a fair shout that if your catheter has fallen out, it's below the level of zero. Absolutely. The giveaway here is that you're right, it's both catheters. So it's something usually in relation to where the transducers are. So your patient moving would be the most obvious one. In this case, we have a, um, a mechanical movement of the transducers, either up or down. And um, so this steady change might be us moving the transducers around our patient or the patient very steadily moving into a different position. So what do we need to do about that? We just need to make sure that we've moved the transducers back to the level of the synthesis pubis because a resting pressure of zero would imply that your patient is a vacuum, that they're sucking, which we all know doesn't happen. And there's your second giveaway that your patient is moving. Those movement artifact lines that you get are the other giveaway that your patient has changed their position. Nothing that needs to be done about them, just be aware that that's what they are. Um, I'm going to stop now because I believe that Marcus is, has joined us for his, but um, there are lots of different examples of these and I'm more than happy to go through them with anyone who, who would like further information on troubleshooting. Laura, thank you very much indeed for taking us through that and uh, for respecting the timing. Um, but it would be good if anyone's got a question for Laura or something that... Uh, popped up in, in her talk that you wanted to ask, just to do so now while it's fresh in your mind. If there's um, anything you want to put in the chat or raise a hand just to pose a question or something that's come to mind as a result. Yeah, Andrew, please. Hi, Laura, thanks for that. I mean, the, the pump artifact is one you're showing. I mean, you, you said there's nothing much you could do about it, but sometimes it's when the filling line's resting on the bladder pressure line, isn't it? Or if, if you're using a, a double sort of setup, the, you haven't disconnected the pressure line from the filling catheter properly. Yeah, exactly. Really good point. And, and worth noting for anyone who does use um, at that separate system, that if you have got your filling line and your recording pressure line too close together, so if they're on the patient's leg strapped close together, you will get that sort of pump artifact as well. A gentle movement apart and then maybe a bit of tape to keep them from touching is, is really useful. Um, a slowing down of the filling will also remove a lot of that pump artifact, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a good tip to uh, to be aware of. Thank you. Last chance for any question now. Um, we'll have a chance after 
uh, Marcus speaks to have some more questions too. Okay, well, let's hand over to you, Marcus, and uh, invite you to uh, take on the subject of interpretation and what do we do with all this data that we've so wonderfully created. Good. So I hope people are feeling resilient and strong. It's quite a long uh, occasion, a course of this duration. So well done, everybody, for sticking with it. Uh, so we're now going to discuss some aspects of interpretation. And we are going to be talking through the importance of being confident about looking at the resting baseline pressures and, and really understanding what they're actually telling us. A few aspects of artifact that uh, reinforce or go over additional points from what we've already been talking about. Um, where we find the pressure measurements uh, in the actual trace when we're looking at important aspects like the bladder outlet obstruction index and, and fundamentally following a systematic approach as we look at our traces so that we can really be certain about what we're dealing with. So one of the things that we need to be certain about is the sort of range of pressures that we are expecting. So when somebody is actually lying flat, of course the organs of the chest and the abdomen are now not lying on top of the pelvis. So consequently, we are expecting a relatively low pressure within the pelvis. It won't be non-existent uh, because there's the actual weight of the tissue surrounding the, the bladder and the rectum. So at rest, a relatively slim person will have about 10 centimeters of water if they're in the supine position as their resting pressure for abdomen and bladder. It will be higher if they're obese. But when you go to the seated position, obviously the organs then transfer onto the pelvis and you expect a higher resting pressure. When you go to the standing position, there's a slight further increase in the resting pressure above that scene when seated. We're not totally confident on explaining why that should be. Perhaps part of it is that when you're seated, there is some support for any adipose tissue, but the realistic answer is we can't quite explain exactly why you go up further as you stand up in the resting pressures. So what I'd like to really get across is some important aspects when you're looking at a trace. If you've not been given a complete history, can you nonetheless make some useful deductions about what's going on with an individual patient? So when we started out a couple of hours ago, we emphasized the importance of scrutinizing what you're actually being shown with a urodynamic trace. So the first thing that we suggested was to look at the information provided. So here we're being given the volume that's been put into the bladder, abdominal pressure, physical, subtracted detrusor pressure, and the flow rate. Not uncommon to see 100 centimeters of water displayed in the pressure ranges, 25 mils per second in the flow. I think this is a scale that goes up to 600 for the volume, but we're actually told that this is at capacity 222 mils. We also emphasize the value of looking at the time scale over which the information is presented. And in this case, we are seeing that the time scale is going up to about 13 minutes uh, for the overall duration of the study. Then we go over to the left-hand side of the trace, and here we're given a nice, confident, definite statement that we have got zeroed to atmospheric pressure. Completely flat is basically probably atmospheric recording, and it's on the zero line, so we can say zero to atmospheric pressure. Now there's an interesting aspect of the trace here, uh, just straight after we start recording from the patient, if I could get my arrow to appear on my laptop, here it is. So you see a little jump here and a little and a further jump here as we go between zero to atmosphere and full recording from the patient. Would anybody like to suggest why is there an additional leap 
here when we switch from recording to atmosphere to recording to patient. Any, any thoughts on that? Now, Andrew, I think some of the feedback's coming through on the chat, but I mysteriously have no vision of the chat here. I'll keep an eye on it for you. So any thoughts from anybody on why there are two steps between atmospheric recording? All oh, right, now I can actually see. So patient has moved perhaps? Well, that's relatively unlikely. Now transducer movement. Now there is an interesting point because when you see an absolute pressure in a patient, it's not absolute pressure, it's relative pressure. It's the difference in pressure between the transducer and the patient's organ will be affected if the patient moves or if the transducer moves. So when you are setting up a study, if the transducer is not quite at the correct height, and the correct height is level with the pubic symphysis, then there is a button on the machine that you can use. You press it and the platform will rapidly go up to the selected height. So that's what's happened here is they've started recording from the patient. The transducer is not quite at the right height. So started recording here. So for this, they've moved the transducer here. And now the transducer is level with the pubic symphysis. So it's at this point that we're actually seeing resting pressures. Interesting to note, there's a little blip on the abdominal pressure line here. Would anybody like to comment what this blip is about? It's only in the abdominal line. It's not seen in the vesicle line. So, comment that it might be rectal activity. Now the rectum is a contractile organ, but it's going to cause a rise in pressure. And that is going to look like a phasic rise, a little hummock. So a contraction in the rectum actually doesn't really look like this. A flush has also been suggested, but the flush, the syringe generates a hell of a lot of force that goes straight across the transducer, tends to look extremely big and tends largely to be upwards with no downwards component. So actually what this little blip here is, something's just knocked the line, given it a little nudge. Perhaps um, as the patient moved, it slipped off um, the patient's knee or something and landed on the couch. So it's just a little flick. And so hence there's an upwards and a downwards component, which is not biological. It's that the tube's got a little gentle nudge. Here, we've obviously got a cough. It's nice and prompt and very similar in the two lines, subtracts out nicely. And so you can be confident that this is a nicely subtracting cough. At this point, you're starting to see, if only I could see my arrow. Here's my arrow you're starting to see detrusor overactivity. And that's prominently present. It never reaches a particularly high amplitude, but it's prominently present right up throughout filling virtually. When you see a slightly higher detrusor overactivity, it's quite common practice just to stop the filling a moment. And that's the case here. The filling has been discontinued temporarily in order to wait for this detrusor overactivity to settle back down to baseline before restarting the filling and then stopping filling here because there's been some further detrusor overactivity. Now, an important aspect of urodynamics is that we are expecting this sort of thing, which is the fine movements generated by a patient because they are moving, they are breathing, and so the expiratory activity of the diaphragm in emitting breathing changes abdominal pressure, which is picked up in the rectal catheter and in the bladder catheter. 
So by seeing this fine movement, you are actually aware that both catheters seem to be picking up the alive patient, and that's a reassuring feature. So perhaps it's not entirely necessary to do a very large number of coughs to confirm subtraction because the fine movements are actually pretty reassuring. Now, the quality check can comprise the checking of the fine movements and the coughs. And here is a very important cough done at the end of the urodynamics study, which is a confirmation that at that point, both transducers are still picking up fine. It provides a reassurance that during the preceding period, we have got a reliable um, confidence about pressure recording. Here's another artifact. This is very similar to this one here, apart from being bigger. So this is very likely to be where the vesicle line has got knocked, causing only the blue line to do this very abrupt chum. It doesn't look like a flush. It doesn't look like an overactive contraction. It looks like a catheter simply been knocked. So an overview of this study would tell us that we're happy with many aspects. We're being given the traces appropriately displayed with the volume and the abdominal pressure higher up in the uh, printout, the key aspects of vesicle, detrusor, and flow in the lower half, zero to atmosphere, resting pressures in the appropriate range, fine movement being picked up, coughs subtracting fine throughout the study, there's a bit of detrusor overactivity. So now the question is, what is the problem with this test? Why am I going to criticize this very severely, publicly, in the setting of a teaching course? What's lacking? So I'm keen for some comments in the chat to say, okay, this test is unusable. An explanation why. So it looks like I need to give a strong hint, and that is this, labels. When you look at those labels, what do you take from them? So I will have to ask, when you see a label, I think that says LN, and one of them says PI, and one says DE, and another one says PI. You look at that and you say, oh, I don't understand. Ah, now, here's a useful bit of feedback from the chat. No sensations, no key code, cannot understand. Exactly. These labels, they're just meaningless. They're done at the time of the test, but unless it's actually clear in the printout, the information that you are actually given, they're utterly useless. Now, when you look at a filling cystometry, you are expecting to see labels to indicate when sensations arose and when provocation tests were done and events that happened. And the particularly important one is when you reach systemic capacity, and even more important, the permission to void. And those key indicators are not given in this test. Now, why is that problematic? It's incredibly important because we need to decide what is going on when we see flow. So picture this. What if this is actually before permission to void this flow here? Then that would make this detrusor overactivity incontinence. 
And likewise this, until we know when permission to void is given, we don't know if this is actually simply detrusor overactivity incontinence. Alternatively, what if one of these indicators is actually the permission to void? In that case, we'd say, well, this is a nice prompt detrusor contraction, rather a high pressure and a low flow, and therefore this person has got bladder outlet obstruction. So it's an incredibly frustrating issue that unless you've got clear labeling, the ability of somebody that was not present at the test to scrutinize the trace and confirm whether they trust it is completely lacking. And so I cannot tell you, because I can't remember where permission to void is, whether that is the true overactivity incontinence or bladder outlet obstruction. So here we've got an important demonstration of the need to check continuously whether there are problems present. So when you look at this study, there is an issue that the bladder pressure, the vesicle pressure, is plotted higher up on the trace. That is against ICS recommendations. We are seeing vesicle, abdominal, and detrusor pressure. We're happy to see that the transducers have been zeroed to atmosphere, but we are not happy to see that when you start recording from the patient, as here, the resting pressures are completely different, meaning that the detrusor pressure is way off zero. Now it's more than a 10 centimeters difference. And so that does actually indicate completely unacceptable. Now, when we look a bit further on, we see that there is a change in position during the test. And we have the frustration that no label to describe that is actually given here. So it's an irritation that we are not being given the full information. In order to sort it out, it's going to be necessary to re-zero and check the transducers. And that's what's been done here. So the vesicle and abdominal pressure have both been uh, opened to atmosphere. The zero button has been pressed. And so you get the atmospheric flat line on the zero, giving us a confidence that now we've redone the zeroing. And it's after that that we start to see the sort of thing that we expect resting pressures of similar amplitude in the two recorded pressures, such that the detrusor pressure is close to zero. And we're starting to see some detrusor overactivity, even at this relatively early stage of the study. Now, please note, there is a difference between cough subtraction and symmetry of resting pressures, because the cough subtraction here actually looks pretty good even though the resting pressures are clearly not. So you do need to get both these parameters appropriately correct early in the study in order to run the test itself. So quality control. When we look at a trace, we need to give it a quick glance and decide do we feel that this is actually a good study, just from a quick check. Make sure that those annotations are absolutely clear cut. You want to be seeing when sensations emerge, when key events happen, like detrusor overactivity and incontinence. You need to know what provocations cause these, and you need to catalog the position changes. And you want to see coughs present, ideally regularly, including before and after voiding, and then you're also expecting to see the fine movements in these uh, recordings, which are a result of breathing and movement. So the annotation is crucial because the investigator may not be the person that actually comes to interpret the trace or indeed suggest the treatment. And so please give these annotations because that then gives you an accurate record of the events. 
Furthermore, it's good practice simply to say what you see. What were the pressures at the start of the test? What were the pressures at the end of filling? What happened during voiding? So let's start to think a little bit about that. Here's another example. Again, it's a trace that was a bit frustratingly that the vesicle pressure is given above the abdominal. But nonetheless, that's standardization. It's not invalidation of the quality of a test. So here, we can say that the vesicle and abdominal pressure were very similar at the start of the test, giving a detrusor pressure of only one. So the vesicle was 24, the abdominal was 23 centimeters of water. That's right at the start of filling. Subsequently, you do notice that the detrusor pressure rises. It's caused by a rise in vesicle pressure, not an aberrant fall in, in uh, abdominal pressure. So this is detrusor overactivity with incontinence. So when you head towards the end of filling, here the pressures have risen quite a lot. The vesicle pressure is now 39, having started out at 24. The abdominal pressure has also increased. And that's an interesting observation. Why would the abdominal pressure increase when it is the bladder that has been filled with saline? Now, the answer to that's actually relatively straightforward. The anatomical relationship between these two organs, the bladder is slap bang next to the rectum. As the bladder fills, it comes up against the pubic bone in front of it. And that actually tilts the bladder a little bit backwards onto the rectum. So the increased weight present in the bladder does translate directly into an effect on the abdomen. So it is not a surprise to see abdominal pressure, specifically it's the rectal pressure that's increasing as a result of bladder filling. So the difference between these two at this point is seven centimeters of water. Now that's valuable for working out important parameters like compliance, which is the relationship between volume and pressure as you go from a defined volume at the start to a defined volume after some filling. Units of compliance are mils per centimeter of water. So in this case, we can imagine that 300 mils was put into this bladder, that's quite common. We're not actually told from the trace that it was 300, so I'm having to guess that. And then you can say that it was a detrusor pressure of seven at the end of filling, one at the start, seven minus one is six. And so if it was 300 mils put in, that would mean the compliance of this bladder was 50 mils per centimeter of water. Voiding pressures are also a very important parameter because they help in men to work out if there's bladder outlet obstruction or detrusor underactivity. Now, as you're aware, it's incredibly important to make sure that when you derive values for the pressures to describe voiding, you do so at a point when there isn't a massive artifact present. Spikes are not really biological. They're usually done because perhaps if it was a man, his hand twitched as he was directing his stream. And so that displaced some of the stream and disrupted the smooth flow of the bladder emptying as it transferred onto the actual flow meter. So we don't trust spikes. Our trouble is that the machine can't really tell a spike from the smooth phasic contraction. And so it's incredibly likely that the machine will say that the maximum flow rate was where the red arrow is pointing because there is a spike, which is the peak point for this flow. So your machine will have said Q max maximum flow rate was here, and therefore the detrusor pressure at maximum flow rate was here. Now, in reality, we need to be taking the underlying smooth curve, which is this, which will give the maximum flow rate corrected by us interpreting the trace as here. 
where it was 17 mils per second. At that precise moment, the detrusor pressure was 77 centimeters of water. So it's pretty quick actually to look at the trace, decide where is the maximum flow rate as we believe from the knowledge of the biology of how the urinary tract behaves, nice and phasic, that's the point where we're going to take it. And we can then work out the bladder outlet obstruction index. P det Q max minus two times Q max. So as we've just seen, the Q max was 17. Twice 17 is 34. That is subtracted from P det Q max, that was 77. So the bladder outlet obstruction index for this man was 43. And what we say is that a value above 40 indicates that the man has bladder outlet obstruction. So the considerations as we interpret the trace need to think through the compliance, the volume, the times, the flow patterns, and the residual. All of these are important descriptors that we use to interpret normality of lower urinary tract function. So we want to approach any given trace in a systematic way, looking for some key points. We want to know what the normal trace characteristics are. We know that humans, their organs work in a phasic way. So we don't really trust a spike. That's probably some sort of artifact like a tube getting knocked or a twitch diverting the stream in a non-biological way. We need to make sure that the traces are presented with good quality, including, incredibly importantly, the annotation, as well as some coughs, hopefully telling us if the lines are behaving themselves. We need to know what the normal values are, and we've given a table of the normal resting pressures, which are lower if the patient is supine, higher if they're seated or standing. And sometimes you can get some nomograms to help you if you're trying to work out about voiding. The ICS nomogram for men with a prostate is very valuable in this regard. So as you practice, you'll be starting to pick up some patterns. And as you recognize these patterns, you'll see that they do repeat quite regularly. And once you can really distinguish normal, then you'll start to see where things may go wrong, which draws me to a conclusion and very happy to take any questions or participate in further discussion. Thank you very much. Marcus, thank you very much indeed for taking us through these in great detail because uh, that's what we have to do in clinical practice. Now, uh, what I'd like to do first of all is ask if there are any questions directly for Professor Drake, and then we can widen it to the rest of us. I see Omar, your hand is up. Would you like to um, pose a question now? Yes. Uh, thank you for the uh, interpretation session. That was very interesting. Uh, for the last trace, uh, the, the compliance we, we, we measured was 50. Uh, but if you look at the trace, it doesn't look like this is a normal bladder compliance. Now, it, it might be because the volume is not 600, because I don't think the bladder compliance was normal in that trace. Yeah, thank you. Take us to that uh, trace, Marcus, and we can have a look. Hmm. Why has it not appeared then? Uh, you need to exit and... Uh, uh, you're at the end of your... End yeah, of exit your... That's it, and then come back. Uh, right. I thought I'd selected it. Um, click, click now, Marcus, and then... Oh. Yeah, you need to finish your presentation first and then start a new one. Uh, 
That's it. Okay, so we're talking about the compliance of this trace. Now, here, you've got a resting pressure with a detrusor resting pressure of one. Mm. Here, you've got detrusor overactivity. This is settled by the time you come towards the end of the trace. You've done an entire load of filling, which isn't displayed on this trace. So when you come to the end of the trace, I would describe this as looking flat. It's not overactive. And so this is actually a pretty unremarkable um, resting detrusor pressure at this stage. This is obviously the voiding phase. I've had to explain that this uh, is permission to void preceding this point. So I I'm not sure if your uncertainty is because at this point you're seeing detrusor overactivity. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's probably that it's plotted at a much uh, broader time scale than you're used to seeing. You don't, you don't normally see an entire screen occupied by only 40 seconds of trace. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if, if you compress that into the more um, compressed time scale that you're used to looking at, this would look like detrusor overactivity. So I think you're being a bit misled by the time scale and confusing this you're thinking that looks like poor compliance, you're confusing that, but actually this is detrusor overactivity at a broad time scale. So Thank you. when you look at this point, you can. I, I guess you're probably much happier when you see this as, yeah. as much. Good question, very good question. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, you've got a question. Yes, thanks, Marcus. Uh, just a question about how much you should fill the bladder to before you do provocative tests like coughing and star jumps and so on. Um, I was always taught that you should only really get up to 500 mils. And if you put more than that in, you might just get an artifact from overfilling. What, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, that's an interesting question too. So from a practical point of view, um, what we tend to do is if somebody doesn't have too much um, of a reduced capacity when you look at their pre-study bladder diary. So if they're capable of holding well over 200 mils, um, what we would tend to do is to fill to about 200 mils and do stress testing. Um, that way we can be reasonably confident of getting some good stress testing done before any subsequent detrusor overactivity kicks in. So we'll do our first set of tests at 200 mils. Then we'll fill to the point of systometric capacity. And then we'll repeat another series of provocation tests. Quite rare for systometric capacity to go above 500 mils. Of course, it can do. So I agree with you that maybe if, if they are comfortable at 500 mils and look like they would accept further, then it would be worth doing another round of provocation tests at 500 mils. So my honest answer is there's no standardized approach to that. You want to take a practical line by doing a set of provocation tests when the bladder's you know, fairly full, but certainly manageable, like 200 mils, then at least you have banked some before the patient becomes desperate for a pee, making it much harder to do your filling systometry provocations. Thank you. Do you mind if I ask another question? Uh, please do, Andrew. And anyone else, uh, get ready to ask one, raise a hand or put it in the chat, but carry on, Andrew. Well, can I just ask you about um, so-called low compliance during filling? I mean, sometimes that can be an artifact of filling too quickly as well, can't it? And um, I mean, you, you often see a little bit of that, but I always used to think it was significant. It was more than 15 centimetres of water when you put about 350 mils in. Is that... Is that a recognized definition or, or, or have things changed? Yeah, so filling rate is very, very important. If you are seeing that the detrusor pressure is, comply is um, climbing uh, during filling, then it is appropriate to slow down your filling rate. Um, and we routinely suggest that you'd fill your neuropathic patients at 10 mils per minute from the start. And what, what you can then do is if, if you build about 40 mils and you're not really seeing any change in pressure at all in resting detrusor pressure, then you can think about accelerating the filling rate, especially if it's a patient where there's a big bladder capacity and um, minimal uh, storage symptoms. 
But if when you start your filling and you do a sort of the common starting rates of something like 30 to 50 mils per minute, if when you start at that rate, you look at the detrusor line and it seems to be climbing in line with the filling and you stop the filling and it stops climbing and maybe drops back down again, then you probably are dealing with an, a bladder with an abnormal compliance. And then it becomes very important to fill slower. So I would drop the filling rate if unexpectedly that's what you're seeing. Um, so to summarize, uh, if you've got a suspicion of a risk of reduced compliance, like a neuropathic patient, you'd always start filling slowly, like 10 mils per minute. If you don't have that suspicion, but when you start the test, you see that there seems to be a reduced compliance, then you would drop the filling rate. Um, and it's really only at the slower filling rates that you can trust your compliance readings. If you've filled faster, you need to wait for the detrusor pressure to settle down to its baseline value before you actually decide on uh, doing your compliance measurement. And that might take a couple of minutes to happen. 15 centimeters of water, by the way, yeah, that's a reasonable climb for 350 mils. So yes, I would be a bit worried about that sort of value. Great, thank you, Marcus, for that, and Andrew for the question. Um, if there are other questions, please do slip one in now, but I would encourage you to uh, come and, uh, to the website, uh, bui.ac.uk, and uh, fire your questions at us there, because we'll always uh, happily deal with things remotely. The other thought, if uh, you're still preparing any questions, is just to assure you that uh, You've got the chance for looking through this uh, webinar again because the workshop is being recorded and will be put out for viewing on demand during the UKCS, uh, the, sorry, the ICS conference in a couple of weeks. So please do uh, have a look if you want to have um, scrutiny of what we've been saying or if you want to get uh, a good look at some of those charts that uh, were up or some of the um, flow charts to do with troubleshooting and you'll be able to get them from the uh, the, the the recording of the um uh, the, the workshop that way so um final chance for any last questions from anyone yeah artem please i can see you waiting for a question hello uh, do you hear me yes we do carry on first of all i want to thank you for excellent workshop uh I'm from Moscow, Russia. Russia. Thank you for my, uh, sorry for my bad English, uh, but I want to ask about, is it necessary, uh, is it, uh, necessary to empty a bladder before systometry uh, when you we have uh, neurological patients? Arturo, do you want to answer that one? Sure. Thank you for your question, uh, Artem. I'm, I'm sure you're English is better than my Russian, so uh, so happy to answer. Um, the, the, question, the, the answer is uh, not, not usually. You can fill up on top of the residual, but it is important to know the residual you're filling on, on top of. What I usually do is if I have a patient that has, let's say, 250 mils of residual, I put the catheters in, I empty the bladder, I go all the way through zero milliliters, but I know that when I am feeling the patient from zero to 200 and to 250, I know that's not the usual patient's capacity. That's not the, the patient's usual way of living. So I, I sometimes do it to know what is going to happen if I, for example, start intermittent catheterization on the patient. And I want to know what is going to happen between zero and 250. But the practical answer to your question is, no, you, not, you do not, not need to empty the bladder uh, when you have a neurological patient, unless you want to know what's happening with the lower volumes he doesn't usually have. Thank you. Okay, I hope that uh, helps you. I can see there's um, a chat uh, question there about uh, good reading material, and Marcus highlighted earlier the fundamentals documents in neurourology and neurodynamics, and I would point you towards those, first of all, as the, the best summaries that uh, we have. 
Um, we are right on time, and we're going to need to uh, stop this uh, recording to keep us to the three-hour limit. But I want to thank you all for persevering to the end, for joining us on the workshop, and look forward to seeing many of you, I hope, at future real meetings uh, or being in touch with you uh, online. So thanks to Laura and Arturo and Marcus for joining us, for Rob uh, helping us in the background too. And very best wishes to you all. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.